Good, well, welcome very much um, to the Royal Society of Medicine, uh, which I think is a, a fitting venue for this uh, discussion. Uh, many uh, luminaries um, have been fellows of this uh, institution. Um, to name a few of the most relevantly, I would say the great, great, great grandfather of One Health, Charles Darwin. Um, uh, Jenna, the smallpox, uh, uh, inventor of the smallpox vaccine, and perhaps most fitting, Alexander Fleming, the inventor or the discoverer of penicillin, um, who was president of the pathology section of the RSM uh, from 1932 to 1934. And um, with that uh, list of luminaries, it leads me very neatly to introduce our keynote speaker, Professor David Heyman, um, who probably doesn't need much of an introduction, but I'll do my best. 25 years as a medical epidemiologist with CDC and a similar innings uh, at WHO. Um, uh, Chair of uh, Public Health England and senior, senior fellow at Chatham House. Now a professor of infectious diseases at uh, my alma mater, the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and a uh, faculty member at the Sir Saw Hock University uh, in Singapore. So we have a lot to get through today. Um, and I think that's enough out of me. So I'd rather hand over to David. Thank you very much, David. Thanks very much, Toby. Thank you. And uh, thanks for having invited me today. So the theme of this meeting, I can get it up on the screen. Okay, the theme of this meeting is prevent, detect and respond. And I thought what I would do is first of all, talk a little bit about what we're trying to prevent. And what we're trying to prevent, I think, is breaches in the species barrier and emerging infections in humans. And we have a good selection of some of them that have occurred in the past 50 years, but there are in fact, many, many more. And so these are infections that come at the animal-human interface. And when they, when they enter human populations, they emerge. And they have three pathways that they can generally follow. They can emerge in no further transmission. Rabies is a good example. It comes from a dog, it infects a human. It doesn't go from human to human unless there's an organ transplant from an infected person. Then there's one that continues transmission and ceases and becomes sporadic. Think of Ebola, think of H5N1 avian flu, which the press is excited about again. Think about many other infections that transmit from human to human, but then disappear and may in fact reemerge. And then there are the infections that continue transmission and become endemic. And the most recent one of course is COVID-19. And prior to that, it was HIV. Both of these are infections from the animal human interface that then become endemic. And looking at the endemic infections, there are actually four human coronaviruses, as you know, that are endemic. And those all have an origin in a reservoir in nature, probably a bat or a rat. They then infect an intermediary animal and go on and infect humans. And I'd like to just focus on HCOV, human coronavirus OC43, a virus which causes the common cold, it peaks in the winter, early spring, mild disease, upper respiratory tract, and the elderly are hit the most. And this, um, is, um, this is a study that was done, and many of you maybe have seen this, by a group out of Belgium after the SARS outbreak in 2003. The dots on the A-line represent all the known human coronaviruses, OC43, that were either sequenced or in laboratories that could be sequenced. And what the investigators did was took the specimens from 1950 onwards, and they calculated a rate of mutation going forward, assuming that there was a regularity to that mutation. They then took the bovine coronavirus, which is the one most similar to the human coronavirus, OC43, and they back, back modeled both of those using the infection, the mutation rate, to see where both of them may have been approximately equal. And they came to a line uh, between 1850 and 1900. In 1889, there was a pandemic called the Russian flu. Uh, and this was a pandemic which killed actually over a million people in a very small world back then. But there were neurological symptoms that weren't consistent with influenza. And so their hypothesis was <clears throat> that this was the emergence of OC43 
It emerged as a pandemic from a common bovine ancestor late in the 1880s, and now it's endemic. Only a hypothesis, but a good frame in which to place the other coronaviruses moving forward, because there are three more human coronaviruses, as you know, that have emerged in the last, um, in, in the present century, in fact. And the first one um, was in 2003. So talking about prevent, I just like to not talk about what we learned from these outbreaks, but what we learned and didn't apply. And so in uh, the SARS coronavirus outbreak in 2002, 2003, this is known to have been an emergence in a live animal market in the Guangdong province of China. China did not report this infection and would not report it for many, many months. But on the first, 21st of February, a person who had been treating patients in that epidemic in China came into Hong Kong. He was sick, spent one night in the hotel. He spent a night in the room K, the green room, and people in the blue rooms became infected and went back home with infection. A study done after it was known what caused this outbreak, um, looking on the carpet, at scrapings on the carpet in front of his room and in front of the lifts a month later, found PCR fragments of what was then known as SARS coronavirus 1. And these people returned still in the incubation period around the world, showing our political leaders that borders cannot stop infectious diseases, a lesson they didn't learn very well in the current outbreak. SARS spread worldwide in 2002, 2003, but it was a, quite a small outbreak, 2000, just over uh, 2,500 cases and 10% uh, mortality rate. So it was quite um, a very serious virus infection. So SARS came to an end. The world actually worked together under a, a director general, Brundtland at WHO. Brundtland was a former political leader in Norway and Nor a prime minister. She was also a pediatrician and very strong. And she didn't wait for consensus from her country. She said, this is what we're doing. And they did it. And she said, we should stop traveling to places where there were uncontrolled outbreaks. The world stopped and the outbreak stopped. And this did not become endemic. This, the last human infections, however, were in research laboratories in Singapore, Taiwan, and China. So SARS is no longer, it didn't become endemic. It was a disease that could have possibly didn't. And the last cases were in laboratory accidents. Now, this is SARS in China. Uh, China did not begin to report anything or work with WHO until April. They were hiding what they had, but they knew what they had. And this is what they had. And you can see that in February, when this doctor came out of China into Hong Kong, who was infected, he was one of those on the gray bars, a person who had been infected because hospital workers amplified transmission of this outbreak in China. And they also amplified it outside of China, wherever it went. And this shows you nosocomial transmission of SARS coronavirus in Singapore, one of the most um, important uh, countries in the world as far as technologies. And you can see that healthcare workers were infected. They infected a patient. Other health workers got infected, if you look on the right. And there were others who got infected as well as patients in the hospital. This is the way many, many, if not most, emerging infections amplify. If you look at Ebola, if you look at other infections, they amplify by poor infection prevention and control measures. This is some research that was done in China by the Chinese after the SARS outbreak ended in 2003 or just at the close. And what they found was in their research that 80% of animals from one animal market in the Guangzhou province contained significant levels of antibodies to SARS coronavirus. And in another study, they looked at market workers, 13% of animal market workers were, had antibody to SARS coronavirus as opposed to 3% in the community. And so there were many lost opportunities to really move ahead and to prevent the next outbreak. But we didn't take heed and we had the next outbreak. We could have done many things. We could have seen that instead of closing down their markets in China, they actually did some education and helped them understand the importance of prevention. Could have been many other things, better infection prevention and control, but we didn't have it and we had the outbreak. This is MERS coronavirus, merged in 2012 from camels, carried by camels, camels likely infected by bats. 
This is the outbreak in the Middle East in the two years, the first two years of the outbreak. And you can see that it was not amplifying in transmission greatly, but there were peaks in certain months of the year. And this spread internationally as do most Europe, international, uh, most infections today in a globalized world. Now, this was also an infection which was amplified by poor infection prevention and control. This is the outbreak in Korea, South Korea, in 2015, when one man in blue returned to um, South Korea from Saudi Arabia and went to three different health facilities and started an outbreak, which then went throughout many different health facilities and, in fact, uh, infected over 200 people, including health workers. 69 of those people were health workers, and over uh, 35, 35 of those people died. Again, looking at SARS coronavirus, MERS coronavirus, transmitted to, to humans by an animal at that animal human interface. The main type of transmission is nosocomial in healthcare settings, but there is small level of household transmission and to patients who are sick. But this disease never became endemic in humans, but it did become endemic in camels, and it still is endemic in camels in the Middle East and in Africa. And what we know now is that African camels in many parts of sub-Saharan Africa also carry antibody to this coronavirus, but the studies have not been done to see what might happen there. We just watch things instead of really acting when we have the research information that we need. And so we have to put more emphasis on learning our lessons from the research that's done during and after pandemics. Detecting is very important as well, but we'd all like to prevent rather than detect. But detecting can lead to prevention as well. So detection is very important and we have many systems that we could expand and we have newer tools. And I'll just go through a few of them because I know you all know many of them. This is the Influenza Surveillance Network, a 75 year old network that takes virus specimens from people with influenza-like illness. The laboratories are national laboratories around the world. They send the virus, if they can't sequence it themselves, to centers that can do the sequencing. And those sequences are gathered together on a common platform. This, uh, sorry, the platforms disappeared. On a common platform called GISAID. And that platform is then used to identify the most dominant strains, which are used in the next season's vaccine. Now, that system is also important for other um, novel influenza viruses as well. And it first detected H5N1 in Hong Kong back in 1997. A laboratory over in Rotterdam isolated the virus and identified it from a specimen that the Hong Kong laboratories could not identify. And so H5N1 we know now is a zoonotic infection. It's endemic in birds and chickens first in uh, Asia, but now throughout the world. And it is a threat to human infections, especially if animals that are infected with this virus, H5N1, become infected with a human virus that has um, uh, from a human, and both of those viruses end up in the same cell, reproduce and reassort. There could be a major pandemic. So there is a concern about this. WHO said it was a low risk. I don't think I would agree with that. I don't think we can determine the risk, but there is a risk from this as well. And GISAID, uh, the group that's used, the platform being used to collect genetic sequences for influenza is also using for, used for um, COVID-19. So it's a very important system and we can build on what's out there already in innovative detection systems to get more traction. This is the polio eradication network similar to the network for influenza, except this is looking at enteric infections rather than respiratory infections. The same principle, laboratories around the world doing genetic sequencing, and that genetic sequence is very important to determine when diversity in the virus decreases and when actually you're coming to the end of an eradication effort. This also has an environmental component, which is very strong and very important. And this shows you environmental polio surveillance in the sewage network in Cairo in Egypt. That network was used to determine when, in fact, um, the polio virus, the wild polio virus type one disappeared from Cairo. What you can see here is um, genetic um, polio virus, I'm sorry, that was sequenced 
isolated from fecal from sewage specimens in this area in uh, the the risk area in Egypt. And the red represents wild polio virus. The blue represents also a live virus, but the Sabin virus, which is there because of vaccination. And you can clearly see that polio disappeared in um, the second week of 2005, or the fourth week rather. And after that, it stayed free of the, of, and, and polio was gone from Egypt. And then this would be very useful in antimicrobial resistance as you're moving forward, making sure that there is environmental surveillance systems in countries and that they can be used not only for COVID-19, but also for looking at antimicrobial resistance. A very important step forward that, that really is necessary to identify new polio viruses. And that's the system that in here in the UK identified the uh, polio virus in the sewage systems here in London. There are also many cutting edge electronic technologies. This is the first one that was really set up. This is the Global Public Health Information Network. It scans the web every 24 hours looking for keywords that might indicate a cluster of infection. And this is done also for other hazards, chemical hazards as well. And it's run out of Canada looking in seven different languages for reports that might be an outbreak. This information is then passed on to WHO. WHO confirms or validates it. And this system was very important because already in the 16th of November, WHO knew from GFIN that there was a respiratory illness and the government was recommending isolation. But when China was approached, they said, oh, it's nothing to worry about. It's influenza. 11th of February, again, Guangdong outbreak of atypical pneumonia among health workers. This is before that doctor came out into Hong Kong. The official government report was atypical pneumonia, but it was not worried. No viruses isolated. And then on the 19th of February, a 33-year-old man in Hong Kong actually got avian influenza, um, was diagnosed with avian influenza through the global influenza surveillance network that I showed you. So you can see how all of these networks are very important global goods and can be used for COVID-19 and detecting other outbreaks, whether it's cholera or an outbreak of antimicrobial resistant strains. PROMED, some of you will be members of this. PROMED is an international discussion group, an international society for infectious diseases um, innovation. This has a team worldwide that's constantly receiving um, dialogue from people in their regions and also globally. And then this dialogue puts out information that could be useful everywhere else. This is Dr. Zaki who identified MERS coronavirus first in Saudi Arabia in 2012. The government did not want him to report, however, to WHO. And so he reported to ProMed. He reported to ProMed, this was out on the web, and he actually provided a genetic sequence that was put out on the web as well. And this genetic sequence permitted, um, at that time, the Health Protection Agency, Maria Zambone and her lab, to identify that a patient admitted to St. Thomas was actually infected with this new coronavirus and not infected with, um, um, with anything else, with the SARS coronavirus, which is what everybody thought, that first virus. So this was a very important way of sharing data and it points to the importance of sharing data and understanding how to use it. And this was a, a Qatari male who eventually after 12 months died. There are other ways to also detect, and this is flu near you participatory surveillance in the US where people can report when they have symptoms of flu on a channel on their, um, in an app on their uh, iPhone. And when they report, they then get feedback telling them what to do with uh, when they have an infection. This is how it works. It puts out information near you uh, and it puts out information that goes to the uh, central government as well in the US. And it provides collective understanding of influenza at the local, at the regional and national levels. A very important system to identify with community participation what's going on. And that's where detection really occurs at the community level. That's where it's most important. And this is that same type of an application, but this is for animals. And it was set up as a pilot project in Chiang Mai where agriculture workers can report outbreaks in their animals on a channel to uh, Chiang Mai Health Department. There then is an investigation to see what's going on in those animals. And they can hopefully prevent 
an animal infection that's beginning to spread in humans from going any further. And then, of course, there's the Google flu, flu trends and other um, trends on, um, on Google. And this shows you Google flu trends detected a significant increase in flu interest activity. Actually, <clears throat> before CDC in Atlanta published um, their data, it was two weeks behind the Google. So very powerful electronic systems. And this is one that's been developed by Jillian Smith in the, in the Health Protection Agency days and then been used by Brian McCloskey during the Olympics. This system has set a baseline for different syndromes, including what I'm showing you here, the cold flu indicator. The baselines are a threshold. When there's a activity above that, either determined from NHS direct or from other sources, including emergency department scanning automatically, um, there is an investigation. And this then puts the information out in a barometer format showing what's happening. And if cold and flu gets into that red or orange area, there will be an investigation. So an early detection system, it's very important. And finally, Europe has had to set up a system of anti-vax for um, measles. And they were looking for where measles activity questioning was import most important on the web. So they could go in there and see if indeed there was some anti-vax activity. And this could also, this is the queries of measles showing that there were outbreaks that occurred after um, the article that linked um, um, measles vaccination with autism, a bogus article, but this could also be used for anti-vax movements for COVID-19 as well. And finally, respond. And what's important here is to understand that there is no harm in using a precautionary measure that might have to be changed later on as evidence develops. And there was great reticence to do that in the outbreak of of in the pandemic rather early on. We knew early on that this was a respiratory infection and respiratory infections put out droplets. Those droplets can infect face to face through any mucous membrane. And they can also drop on objects which become fomites so they can infect from that. That part was understood. What wasn't understood was whether or not it was aerosol, but nobody was willing to say that yet there was lots of evidence suggesting that that was the case. Here's an article from China in January already, 2020, showing that index case C sitting on a bus, going, traveling to an event um, that was a, a Buddhist gathering um, on bus number um, uh, two, no, on bus number one, sorry, infected people sitting near him, uh, clear evidence that this was transmitting in closed spaces. Here's another example that was published by the Chinese. They documented a birthday gathering in a Chinese restaurant, and they identified people who were infected after that, and they hypothesized that air conditioning was taking this through. And the event in Seattle and Washington, March 2020, when there was choir practice where there was a person who had an upper respiratory infection, and that person during a closed session of choir practice in a closed space was able to infect all those different people. So we knew already in March that we needed to prevent transmission coming from others. We had masks that could have been worn to protect the nose and mouth and protect others. We didn't know for sure that there was evidence that said they would protect, but they could have been used at a, as a precautionary measure, yet they weren't. And WHO didn't actually recommend wear masks to prevent others, infection of others until 2020 June, six months later. They could have made a precautionary measure earlier. They could have then changed this measure as more evidence came in if they needed to, but they didn't. And it's the same with our countries in Europe and in North America. In Asia, already in early January, in late January and early February, they were doing what was called outbreak investigation, which we all know about. And they were doing a respectable job with it. They identified where cases were coming from and they identified contacts and got them isolated. And they showed where transmission was occurring through this system. And you can see through their outbreak investigations, there were a lot of people, a lot of areas where they knew transmission was occurring. And so when they looked at one sector in particular, they then closed that sector down and they waited to see if they had had an impact and if they hadn't, they closed it down again. But they were actually doing good epidemiology rather than sitting and watching the outbreak occur in the world. South Korea did the same. They had a major outbreak in a religious group. 
They were able to do contact tracing, isolation, uh, follow up on their contacts, and were able actually to stop the outbreak in com completely, waiting for four new cases to be imported. So they slowed the entry of these viruses into their countries rather than having to wait as we waited in Europe until they overwhelmed our hospital systems. And then when they overwhelmed them, such as here in Italy, where this is an ICU, an intensive care unit in a hospital that had collapsed because of COVID-19. Um, and we also saw that our health systems couldn't cope with routine diseases during the pandemic either. And we saw excess mortality, probably due to the fact that people couldn't access healthcare with regular, for regular treatment. What you can see here is the shaded area in brown, reported COVID deaths, the excess deaths after COVID much higher than the death rate that was predicted um, and the excess death rate predicted. And we also know that our populations were very unhealthy. They had many comorbidities and those comorbidities were the people who got serious illness after infection and who unfortunately died. So if we're going to detect, prevent, and, and, in, and detect, prevent, and <laughs> I wish it was all prevent, actually. <laughs> if we were to detect, respond, and prevent, the lessons we must heed are detect, we need strong capacity to detect and respond where and when outbreaks occur to prevent international spread. And we need to be working in a one health way so that we know what's going on in animals as well. To respond, we need resilient and safe healthcare with a surge capacity and continuity of routine care. And to prevent, we need effective health promotion to better ensure healthy populations that resist poor infection outcomes. We need to create a one health environment in our governments, and we need to be ready for research during outbreaks for prevention in the future. So thanks very much for having invited me. I hope this has just stimulated your thinking a little bit and that you will think about detect, prevent, prevent, and maybe change it all to prevent. So thanks very much. Thank you very much, David. Uh, fascinating, uh, as always, and a, a, a wide range of uh, data sources and, um, you know, it just shows the, the application of raw science um, into infectious disease control. So thank you very much indeed for that. Um, we'll move directly on, I think, to our panel discussion. So I'll introduce our uh, moderator, uh, Dr. Bob Fryatt, who is uh, relatively new to Mott McDonald, but not new at all to the world of glo global health. Um, and I will let you uh, introduce your uh, panelists and uh, yourself. Thank you. Oh, I'm staying. Okay. Yes, I'd also want to thank uh, David for that fantastic opening. That's tremendous. We are now going to have three panel sessions, and the first one is going to be on the prevent, try and dig down on some of those um, points that David's already made. I'd like to introduce the um, panel. We're going to have um, Dr. Gabriel Lang. Lang, who's hopefully online um, and will be speaking to us. Dr. Uh, Dr. Lang is um, works for SCI Foundation um, and is a veterinary and infectious disease epidemiologist um, and the policy advisor on One Health. Um, is also a member of the network for Eco Health and One Health. Um, we'll, I'd also like to invite Dr. Osman Dar up to the panel. You may. And. Uh, Dr. Dar is the um, works for the UK Health Security Agency, in um, but also for Chatham House, where he's director for the Global Health Program on, on One Health projects. Um, and my name, so I've, I've skimmed over my name. I'm Bob Fry, the international health lead at Mott McDonald, um, and I've worked for sort of thirty years in in public health in WHO and DFID and various other organisations, but now with Mott McDonald. So we, we're going to ask each of, and, and so we, we were going to have Dr. Uh, Alimi from CDC, but last night, unfortunately, to pull out because of some, some unfortunate lurgy that she, she's got. Um, and so Toby's very kindly sitting, sitting in for us um, for the, as our third panelist. Um, and the way we'd like to do this panel is to have um, five minutes opening comments from each of the panel members. And we'll be starting with Gabrielle. Um, and, then, um, and then we'll have a few questions amongst ourselves based on what we've heard, and then we'll open it up to the audience here and online. So Gabrielle, it's, I see we have you um, uh, connected, so over to you for your, uh, your opening comments, what you've heard about prevention. Are we there? 
Thank you. Yes, but I'm hoping my Malaysian internet manages to hold out, if that's okay. Um, so I'd love to touch on two points in response to the questions on prevention. Um, and the first is around I need to take this whole ecosystem view of the problem. I know David touched on the One Health approach earlier, um, and I think that really we want to make sure that we understand that isn't just about the interface between humans and animals, or even the interface just between humans, animals, environment, but that whole um, systems approach. People don't live their lives in neat little silos according to human, animal, or environmental health all being separate. And in fact, most of us interact with animals and plants in a shared environment nearly every day. So we need an approach that reflects this one health reality when we're talking at it, about it from a, from a policy point of view. And the reasons that pandemics emerge in people are often complicated, and we've heard many examples from David there, um, and just one factor down a chain of events or risk drivers that might actually be occurring outside of that human health sector. Um, so I wanted to consider the example of Ebola outbreak in West Africa back in 2015, and considering what has the price of fish got to do with this outbreak. Um, seemingly not a lot. There isn't a, a direct pathogen transmission risk between the fish or seafood, whether that be handled as a live animal or as a food. Um, but in 2013, there were changes made in Brussels to the common fisheries policy, which arguably contributed to the largest outbreak of Ebola um, in history, which was some 5,000 miles away in Guinea, Liberia and Sierra Leone. Um, the Sustainable Fishing Partnership, which was agreed, allowed the EU fishing rights in third countries, which included West Africa. And this in conjunction with illegal fishing, depleted fish stocks, um, damaged marine ecosystems, all led to a reduction of the fish that was available for those local coastal communities where this would usually be their, their primary source of protein. So of course the community looked elsewhere for that protein, for their livelihoods, and turned to the jungle and the hunting of bushmeat, which of course brought communities in closer contact with wild animal species that were potential vectors of Ebola virus. And I'm sure the rest of the story you're familiar with. Um, but there's also other factors at play here as well that could be a part of that kind of pathway to an emergency event in the first place. And things such as uh, deforestation or climate change um, can drive that risk. For example, when you have erratic weather patterns um, or deforestation, reducing the food sources that are offered by the forest. And that can lead to humans and animals both competing then for fewer resources in a smaller space. And again, coming into that closer contact and putting pressure on those um, emergence or, or re-emergence events. So I think it's really important that we commit to this One Health lens and this broad definition um, that's now been widely adopted by, from the One Health high level expert panel. And it's great to see Osman on the panel here today. Um, and we adopt that, that One Health lens right from those top global policies, from the pandemic instrument down to that community health level to reflect the daily lives that people are already leading. Um, and this takes me on to my second point on prevention. It's so important to be strengthening it every day so that it is there for when that rainy day happens. The drivers for emerging infections are not often separate to the drivers for other endemic disease. And the responses to those diseases will use the health systems that have been established for the everyday. These everyday systems can, of course, be enabled to reapply their skills and services in the event of the exceptional. Um, for example, action on neglected tropical diseases are quite often focused on areas where there might be high risks for emerging infections as well. And this everyday needs to go across all sectors and scales. We need strong community level health across humans, animals and environment to build those resilient populations. And David mentioned before, those people with comorbidities that were the ones most affected by COVID. Um, and so to, to build those healthy populations who are less likely to suffer from that emergence event. Um, and also to allow for early detection before it even reaches that human population. Um, and there's no point investing in, re in response into those exceptional events because they will have a finite lifespan of public interest or funding. And this was a common complaint that we were hearing when I was interviewing people for a G7 report back in 2021. Um, people lamented the surge of interest for a particular new you know, disease or outbreak, which would get granted some fancy new laboratory equipment. 
but then that wider system around that piece of equipment or the use of that equipment wouldn't be there. Um, it wouldn't get used. Um, so then all the reagents were, or the laboratory parts um, were, were hard to find. It was too difficult to maintain the calibration in the local conditions. And um, we had problems with electricity shortages. All the staff that were trained to use it moved on because they weren't getting to do the work that they wanted to. Um, and so it was just left to gather dust on the side. And I feel like this is one of the lessons that perhaps we haven't learned from former outbreaks as well. Um, so I'd really like to see combining this one health lens and the investment in that overall health system strengthening across the sectors. I just see it as a really easy win for the prevention agenda, um, helping to deliver on those you know, existing health targets across sectors that we've got around neglected tropical diseases or, and, and on that global health security side as well. But it also holds a bit of potential to reap some perhaps unexpected additional rewards as well of working across those sectors. And we've got some lovely examples from Chad where combining livestock vaccination and veterinary care with a childhood vaccination improved the vaccination uptake and the coverage for those hard to reach children in nomadic pastoralist communities. And additionally, when they were sharing logistics, personnel and transport, for example, they managed to reduce their costs by about 15% as well. But unfortunately, all of this holistic thinking also requires an evaluation framework that can properly recognize those benefits of prevention over cure, or where we've got a situation where the costs and benefits might fall into different sectors. Um, but I've already talked a lot at the moment, so I'll look forward to the discussion and perhaps we can go to those a little bit more later. Thank you. Gabrielle, thank you very much indeed. That's excellent. So One Health Lens, a systems approach, um, lots, lots to dig into there. Thanks very much indeed. So, um, Osman, over to you. It's just been hot from your Lancet series, which I think has been very stimulating for many of us. So thank you very much for that. Um, but over to you for your opening comments in, on prevention. Um, thanks. It, and uh, uh, Gabby, i got to say, you've stolen my thunder. And I don't really have much to add because that was, I think, very beautifully <laughs> presented and uh, super succinct as well. So, uh, so really, just it's not there honestly really isn't a lot more to add. Um, I think on the definitional piece there, I can say a few words and perhaps I can talk a little bit about what's happening at the at the global, global level at the moment. So I think, firstly, one of the things is um, through our work at OLEP, we spend a lot of time looking at that One Health definition and we sort of reviewed, reviewed over 40 definitions that are circulating. Should we have a narrow lens? Should we take a broad holistic lens? Uh, and we sort of landed on that broad holistic lens element of it but in order to make it tangible and real for people developing programs and priorities and interventions um, that that definition is not meant to be seen on its own accompanying it is a set of principles uh, underlying it there's a separate paper around that and and how that analysis should then be done so so touching on some of what gabby said uh, assessing co-benefits across the sectors Assessing trade-offs across the sectors, because when you choose something, that means you're foregoing something else. There's a risk some, somewhere else that's perhaps emerging. If you if you decide to you know invest in lots of PPE, that means you're also creating a mountain of waste, uh, right? So what are the trade-offs around whatever the intervention is? Um, the principles are really important, I think, and that's part of what needs to be uh, addressed whenever you're looking at monitoring and evaluation of these kinds of uh, initiatives. And those principles are equity. Uh, that there's inclusiveness and socio-political parity when in the design stage of a lot of the interventions, that we're thinking more holistically, we're thinking about a socio-ecological equilibrium, that animals and the environment have their own intrinsic value independent of humans, and, and, and that we have to have this sort of intergenerational approach to it, even when it comes to humans. Um, that we're thinking about stewardship and, and, the, and the role humans play in managing their ecosystems and the animal systems around them. And then we talk, and then finally transdisciplinarity, which is sort of fundamental to the, uh, to the approach. Uh, but extending on from that, um, what we've done a lot of work around what we call a theory of change. And, and at OLEP, we have a, we've, we've sort of got a global theory of change around one, one health. And this touches on many of the issues that Gabby identified. So we've, we've looked at over 60, uh, both anthropogenic, but also uh, uh, climate related, animal health system related factors that lead to the spillover events. Um, and this comes to what I wanna talk about next, which is again, prevention. But what is it that we actually mean by prevention? What is the definition of prevention? Where does prevention end and preparedness start? And then response, and then response after that. 
uh, if you look at what WHO does, they've even split preparedness into preparedness, readiness, and then response. So where does preparedness end and readiness start, and then readiness end and response start? So that itself is a definitional issue, but it's not just an academic debate. It has huge implications in, around where the investment goes in. And I think that's what, that's been the issue and the problem with prevention uh, all along. Not only is it not is it un, is it an underinvested area. Uh, we're not even clear about what we mean by the scope of prevention. So prevention typically means the first emergence of the disease in human populations. But here we're talking about prevention of the spillover event in the first place, the spillover from animals to humans. And there's a whole different set of factors and drivers that lead to that, which also merit that, uh, that investment. And those are often investments outside of the human health system, right? Um, uh, and, and, and so I think that's, that's a really important piece that we need to consider a lot more. Um, we, 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 this needs, needs to be a lot more scrutiny and intensity around how we define that. If you, you know, one of the most important tools that is used at the moment is the joint external evaluation tool. Everybody knows about this joint external evaluation um, that's done at the national level to assess capacities for health security. That is broadly divided across the prevention, prepare, respond, uh, uh, segment or, or rainbows, uh, so to speak, but prevent and respond is quite well articulated and defined within that. But prevent is just everything else is bunged into it. AMR is bunged into it. Governance is bunged into it. Legislation and financing, just whatever didn't fit well, just goes into prevent. So there's clearly not been a lot of thinking done around what constitutes prevent and what the investments are that, that need to be there. So, so I would emphasize that that's something that we really need to think about um, it's what what's what we've been doing in terms of the zero draft uh, for the pandemic treaty, asking them to focus a lot more on the prevent side, because what is it that you're then adding above and beyond what the IHR regulations already do, right? That's what the pandemic treaty should be building on. So that's a focus on prevent. It's a focus on uh, equity and, you know, equitable access to medical technologies, countermeasures, but those countermeasures need to go beyond human health, they need to be animal vaccines where appropriate, need to be interventions in ecosystems where they're where they're appropriate so i think it's taking that more uh, holistic view and then making it real uh, we've tried to do the same with what's uh, called the world bank pandemic fund so it's the prevention preparedness and respond uh, fund but a lot of the investment is structured around pre preparedness and response and we really have to shift that uh, paradigm more up to more to the prevention side because otherwise we're just repeating the same mistakes that we've been making all along Right, we're just repeating those same so same things. And I, I just close by saying that equity and health security are two sides of the same coin. So that's something that's really important to focus on. So even for those that are in high income settings that are perhaps worried more about their own health security, you're not you're never going to have health security globally or regionally or nationally unless equity is embedded as part and parcel of that uh, transaction or that system. Um, it's not sustainable without without that equity focus, and nor should it be. Uh, so, so I just I just emphasize that that that's that's the issue with inequalities. Anyways, it, they lead to uh, to structural instability, and uh, and that applies to health security as well. Awesome. Thank you very much indeed. I mean, very thought provoking. Um, so yes, being clear about what we need to invest in and making it real and focusing on nicely here, focus on equity at the end is great. So Toby, you been you heard David's opening, you had a two, our two panelists. Um, how would you like to add any opening comments? Like that? Thanks very much. Um, I'm standing in as a poor substitute for uh, Dr. Alimi, who couldn't be here. So uh, forgive me if I make any missteps. And I'm interested in provoking a little bit of controversy, but not too much, obviously. Uh, I think I, probably everyone in this room and broader working in this field knows what ought to be done. But the question is what is actually being done on the ground, at the ground level. I have been working in infectious diseases for coming up to 20 years now. Um, at the very early stages of my career, Osman and I met in Northwest Pakistan um, and uh, interacted in a, a refugee setting, refugee camp setting, uh, working on malaria control uh, for a few months. Sometime after that, and I'm gonna tell you a, a short story, uh, I was working in Afghanistan 
uh, as an infectious disease epidemiologist, um, one of very few, I should add. Um, and we encountered a outbreak of a um, unusual presentation of gastroenteritis in Western Afghanistan. And the, the papers published, uh, I think in 2005 or 2000, well, maybe 2008. As it turned out, the story behind this was a uh, camel that was infected with anthrax, was sick and lagging behind the rest of the train of camels and was discarded into a village where they slaughtered the camel and uh, ate it. And there was an outbreak of gastrointestinal, um, sorry, we assumed it was anthrax, but actually it turned out to be plague. And on the base of it, it's very difficult to prevent that from happening in rural Western, the deserts of Western Afghanistan uh, with a poor population and um, furthermore, a very weak health system that took weeks to detect the outbreak, report it up the chain. Uh, my colleague who is a vet, um, uh, works now for CDC, um, went out to Western Afghanistan, exhumed part of the camel, carved off some of its probably quite putrid uh, meat and uh, we were unable to diagnose it in um, Afghanistan because we didn't have the laboratory capabilities. So it was shipped to the Namri 3 facility in Cairo. But the point is of this story is it took us more than six months to identify the infectious agent in this case, by which time the outbreak of course had finished, actions had been taken. But this is a One Health story of uh, crossing of the species barrier that would be extremely hard to prevent. And it could have been prevented, I assume, with decent quality veterinary care uh, being available to the pastoralists who were part of a nomadic tribe who have for centuries, probably millennia, trialed up and down the steps of Central Asia. But without providing those services on the ground to the people that actually need it in a way that they can access it, we're going to continue to see these. Now, this was a, a small sporadic outbreak, but certainly there was a high mortality rate. Uh, a number of deaths, I can't remember precisely how many. But the fact of the matter, this is the real, the real issue that's happening on the ground. So I'm courting a little bit of controversy here by saying, no matter what the Global Pandemic Treaty says, or what the Lancet series says, or what the um, policy papers in individual countries and the uptake of evidence is, it's actually what happens on the ground that really matters. And until we have a system where we can reliably understand the dynamics of uh, zoonotic diseases, whether they're emerging novel pathogens or existing endemic pathogens, it's gonna be very hard to prevent these types of outbreaks. So prevent itself can split into um, you know, several portions um, and some of which fit into the respond um, and uh, detect uh, buckets as well. But we have to think about what we're trying to prevent, preventing emergence of infections, novel pathogens, emergence of existing pathogens from wildlife or animals or um, uh, agricultural animals or prevention of the onward spread of these diseases uh, through measures and then prevention of death and morbidity and economic loss that results from those. So there are a number of different boxes. Um, and I'll, I'll end by saying that I think when we look at the economic cost of um, two of the most recent major outbreaks, obviously COVID-19 as a pandemic and the uh, giant West African Ebola epidemic. If we could take a tenth of the economic cost of those outbreaks and invest those in health services, veterinary services, um, and better detection systems, um, we would be very, very well equipped um, as a world and uh, as specialists in order to deal with these threats. The problem is that the narrative is not seen as an insurance policy, it's seen as a cost. And actually it's not a cost, it's an investment. And until we have governments and people all the way down the chain, mm. understanding that this is a valid insurance risk management strategy, whether you're a nomadic camel trader or you're the Minister of Health or you're in charge of global health security at the World Health Organization, it's gonna be very difficult to convince the public uh, and governments to spend that type of money. But one tenth of the economic cost that I believe could have made a really big impact had it been invested 15, 20 years ago. And we know that these outbreaks 
epidemics, pandemics are inevitable. It's not a question of if it happens, it's a question of when it happens. And the last thing I'd like to say is that by taking stringent measures to uh, prevent the onward transmission or the spread of these diseases, um, it's very difficult to show a counterfactual. So how do you know when you've actually prevented an outbreak if you've prevented it successfully? And this was one of the big problems with the uh, H5N1 highly pathogenic avian influenza. Well, there was no parix, pa pandemic, so what a waste of money. But there was partly no, no pandemic of um, highly pathogenic avian influenza because of the responses that were made. So it's a quite dif difficult narrative uh, for the public to understand. So I'll just end, end with that. Debbie, thank you so much. Um, excellent. Um, we're going to now have a, a bit of a, Q and, a short Q&A session. Um, so if anyone's got any, any questions that I'd like to ask, please let me know. And then we'll go online for any online questions afterwards. Um, so please have a think and please pop, pop your hand up if you have a question. Um, and I'd like to kick off and um, talking to, I mean, Gabriel, maybe I can start with you. Um, I mean, from what we've just been hearing about this, um, there's lots of grand things happening globally with funds and, and treaties, but if we do want to have a more bottom-up approach to prevention, um, do you see this in your research and in your work? Are you seeing that happen in, in, anywhere around the world? Any sort of good practice around bottom-up approaches to prevention that you can perhaps share with us? There we are, over to you. Thanks, yeah. Um there are certainly lots of little examples, and I think the problem a lot of the time uh, with these bottom-up examples for a One Health perspective, where people are working across sectors, is that those, those successes aren't embedded in processes. They are chance encounters, they're good relationships between the vet and the human health outpost in a community. Um, they aren't um, systematic, and so we haven't got this routine collaboration between human animal sector or the environment sector, for example, whether that be on a personal level or just through the data sharing and access to that data. Um, but there are some examples where we have um, health teams, for example, um, during the COVID pandemic that were reapplied. So people who are trained in the laboratory, a lot of the time it doesn't matter what um, species that sample came from, once it's in the laboratory, there's a lot of uh, cross um, sectoral skills, which are the same across sectors, but sometimes there are some bureaucracy, um, which is preventing those kind of joined up approaches. So for example, in Kenya, I know a colleague of mine was explaining that they have a, a, a laboratory that's operating with both human and animal samples, um, but that the staff that are dealing with the veterinary side of things are being paid a lower per diem per day than those on the human health side. So it's not a sustainable relationship. It doesn't breed good collaboration. But then we've also got successful examples on the ground where, um, for example, in Brazil, a lot they run some multidisciplinary health teams which operate at community level and try to offer the health services that are demanded by a household who might have livestock and domestic animals living within their, their realm. So that there is this cross transference between either the animal staff being able to provide advice or, or point people in the right direction for the human health side or, or vice versa. And it essentially, capitalize on that community engagement which we've got through any any health work in making contact with people to be able to deliver the information that can help signpost them and and um and feed that information up the line as well lovely nice examples thank you very much indeed um and and any hands please put your hand up if you've got questions i'll come I'll turn to the audience um yes yeah. And so what further arguments do you take to global policymakers? What would they they need to understand that that can be then investment um with time to help that to happen? Well, uh, the short answer is I wish I had the answer to that question. <laughs> um you know, I think it's um, we have to stack these events up up against um, you know a, a number of extremely important um, priorities that 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 governments are struggling with. Um, you know, I've seen it termed the poly crisis at the moment. Um, it's a it's a um, a time of great political and social upheaval, uh, climate change, uh, and infectious diseases 
unfortunately, a, a relatively low um, down the priority list all, when all said and done. Um, Long-term strategies, evidence, I think there's, there's plenty of evidence. How do we package it? How do we put it into the hands of um, global financial institutions, for example, have a, have a huge amount of sway over um, the um, kind of global risk management, as it were. Um, I, I wish I had a, a simple and short answer. I'm, I'm also interested not just in questions, but also the comments of this, this audience, which is also extremely well qualified. So if anyone's got any ideas, that would be, that would be great. Well. Yeah. <laughs> great, thanks for that. Any other questions or speakers? Oh, sorry, at the back. Sorry, sorry. sorry. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much. Uh, this is Sunny. Uh, um, my question is just a little bit, uh, you know, come across a very controversial level, but probably. Um, I'd like to know what's your take on the growing concern among global populations regarding this pandemic thing. Well, especially the last one that we experienced. Uh, um, they see there is the concern is around they see that we have like uh, some people or even institution trying to somehow instrumentalize the science, take the science in the hands. So, for example, we see like uh, uh, when we have like computer scientists who are the experts of the project, like. Uh, Big data experiments, big data out about how to prevent the pandemic. And we hardly even see the scientists talking more about it. And uh, uh, the European Union, we see the crisis uh, about Pfizer crisis with the president of the European Commission, the man who even about the very much. So people are somehow, global population is in some extent, they are concerned. We are somehow lost about this relationship between investment, banking, and science. What's your take on that? Thank you. Mm. Great question. I'm going to ask them if you ready. For yeah. Um, I, so, so I don't think, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to court this controversy because I think it's a real issue. Uh, so, with this, with this pandemic, we had an infodemic as well. So, lots of conspiracy theories, lots of, uh, you know, false knowledge, lots of false or fake news uh, circulating around the pandemic. So one part of the response is to put enough investment into being upstream of that and 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 countering that as and when it occurs. But also there needs to be a system of better transparency and accountability across government, across the private sector and the public sector, how procurement uh, is done, how uh, contracts are given when you're mounting a response. Uh, so some of those things should be tested as part of simulation exercise or, or you know, surge planning before a pandemic or before an outbreak occurs so that you know that these are, this is, this is a clear mechanism for, for doing this. This is a clear mechanism for uh, around transparency and accountability. This is a clear mechanism around equitable access to those countermeasures, whether it's diagnostics, vaccines, or therapeutics that are then produced. Uh, I mean, there are provisions in international law around this, right? You have the TRIPS provision, the trade-related intellectual property system, which allows countries to, uh, when there's a public health emergency, invoke an exemption. They can create or develop generic versions of uh, vaccine, therapeutics, diagnostics, to so that so that those things are priced at the right at the at the at an affordable level for their population. But there's not the technology transfer that occurs. There's not the sharing of IP. There's lot there's, there are lots of issues around that, which which make uh, which foment the distrust between the public and the government and then the private sector. I mean, some of these are valid issues. So the private sector was indemnified against any, you know, uh, against side effects to the vaccines against uh, for therapeutics. They're, they're, in a sense, holding governments over a barrel because they have to buy and they and they can charge at, in that situation whatever price they want. So, you know, with, with for example, with, a, uh, with the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, um, they, they they charged a much lower price than the, than Pfizer was charged than Pfizer was charging, but it, but you don't want a system where then it's entirely dependent on the goodwill of the private sector, right? It's not it's not a it's not the ideal way of doing it, especially if all the risk is being taken by the public sector. So the public sector does all the risky stuff around the uh, the blue sky science, 
uh, the risky part of developing the diagnostic or the vaccine or the therapeutic, uh, and then and then guaranteeing purchasing once the product is developed. Um, so there, I mean, there are a lot of issues around that, and it's it's uh, it's something that a lot of people are doing work around. But you, you you know you raise some some valid points around that around it. I think. Thank you. I wasn't being rude. I was trying to find a, a, an article from quite recently on the BBC, which was I think the annual trust survey, um, indicating you know who is trusted in their opinions by by um, by the public at large, and uh, politicians, business leaders, uh, bankers, and those that work in finance are. are predictably very low down the risk down the list um scientists are i think if i remember rightly certainly up in the in the top five along with doctors and professionals uh judges at least in in this country um and others so i think you know there's there's two factors to this one is who is seen as an honest broker and an honest honest communicator of risk and the second is when the messages of that those honest communicators are deliberately corrupted and contorted by, um, by with malign intent, um, and that that's a very difficult. That's the infodemic. It's very difficult to uh, counter that when it's done um, uh, maliciously and with with malign intent, um, and that's a that's a very tricky one. Um, you know, the the public opinion moves, um, you know, like the grass in the wind in a way, and uh, trying to win that battle is a is a very tricky one. But we must use our offices to talk as as scientists and professionals to talk honestly about risk um, in 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 private professional and public forums uh, as and when we can. Um, and we must try to do our best to counter um, you know erroneous and deliberately put out um, uh, fake messages, which are obviously have a a major impact, uh, especially in terms of things like vaccine uptake, which we know are. Uh, extremely important. Thanks for that. Thanks for the great question. Well, I think we had time for I, maybe one more. So one more question. Can I just Gabby, come did you want that? to come on, oh, Gabby? Do you want to say? No. Thank you. Yeah, and it couldn't quite hear the question, so apologies. It's a bit off off note, but um, I just wanted to finish on a bit of a more of an optimistic note, perhaps that you know you would never wish it on anyone to go back through this pandemic and again have the same kind of globally affected you know population, but ultimately we have everybody experienced um, the, the impact of a pandemic. So I think now is really the time where we can directly speak to the public. Everybody understands that what the, the risks we're talking about mean on the ground. And also when we're talking about the prevent agenda, you know, people experience that lockdown and perhaps will never go back to that. There will never be the same kind of compliance, I don't think, to that kind of um, policy um, without perhaps with those levels of trust, trust that we, we've got at the moment. Um, so it's doubly important that we deliver on prevention, but also, you know, really capitalize on that public interest at the moment and public understanding for the issue. Thank you. Um, maybe just one quick question, if that's me. Yeah. All right, so I'm one of those low trust people because I work in private equity. So I'll leave after asking this question. Um, magic wand. How much, is, how much do we need? You said 10% of the global cost. How much is that? How many trillions? Uh, uh, you want me to put a figure on it? I, can, I couldn't. Oh, I give couldn't me a range. Um, you know, uh, it very much depends on the context, the country. So um, we're talking about the One Health, okay? Yes. So if you could actually do everything that you wanted uh, with the One Health, how much would that be? And this is for Gabrielle as well. Really for anybody in the audience as well. How much? Just give me a range. Uh, I'll, okay, I'll give you. I'll give you some uh, World Bank studies that have been done around some of this. Uh, around infection prevention and control, there was a good 2010 World Bank study that looked at IPC systems uh, across, I think, 168 low and middle income countries, and their estimate around IPC was between, I think, in the range of. You can fact check me, but and you probably should. But I think it was in the range about of three and a half to six and a half billion. US dollars a year. If you look at prevention as a whole across the sort of one health spectrum, the latest estimates uh, following this pandemic are between 10 to 30 billion uh, dollars a year globally, which I don't think is a lot of money. Yeah, if you look at, I mean, that's across every country. Yeah, so it's not, it's not a huge amount. Yeah. Just changing the narrative with people like me 
we work in private equity. Our new fund is all about infrastructure, commodities, and the climate tech, because climate tech and um, you know infectious diseases are a DNA strand. Both will infect each other. And if we, we're working with some climate scientists that can share the data later when it's ready to go. But what we're finding is what we call the narrowing. As the climate actually warms up, uh, infectious diseases will happen more and more. Uh, and if we don't sort ourselves out, and this is myself, you know, the finance, you know, the finance people, and obviously good people like yourself, let's not even talk about politicians. Um, if we don't sort ourselves out, the what we're predicting is the narrowing is the human habitable zones will narrow to the 49th parallel, which is the US Canadian border, and then just underneath the 69th parallel, which is the Arctic. Everything else is going to be pretty hard to live in. Yeah. yeah. So that, that's the apocalyptic scenario. But 30 million is a bargain to actually stop something like that happening. Yeah. So great. Well, thanks very much for that. And it's good to finish on on, on talking about money. <laughs> don't get prevention without investment. Absolutely right. And of course, it's a, a fraction of what the cost of what the uh, pandemic cost the whole world. But thanks very much to the panelists. Um, Gabrielle, thanks for staying up and joining us. Um, Toby Osman. Appreciate that. I think we're going to have a short break now. Excellent. Thank you all very much for uh, listening and your participation in the first session. We're going to come now to our uh, second session on Detect. Um, and I'm uh, delighted to introduce my colleague and friend, uh, Patrick Mubangizi, who uh, is our um, Africa director for the uh, Fleming Fund, uh, dialing in from Kampala. I hope that his internet um will hold up patrick are you there yes i am um thank you toby can you hear me uh we can hear you loud and clear yeah okay so i'll um, hand over to you now patrick thank you thank you very much so we are going to have uh, the session of detect and um we have three um panelists and there's one presenter um Dr. Um, Pascal Ondoa, she's the SLM uh, Director of Science and New Initiatives, that is Africa Society of Laboratory Medicine. Um, she's been a researcher, a, a senior scientist, and um, she's leading, she's currently leading on um, some of the Fleming Fund AMR technical assistance programs in Africa. Uh, and she's been involved in uh, laboratory system strengthening uh, in the continent. Uh, we also have Peter Elianu, um, Elianu, doctor. Uh, he's currently the director um, of global health security and um, research at Baylor College uh, in Uganda. Um, he's been involved in uh, many um, global health security initiatives and was recently involved in um, Ebola uh, outbreak in Uganda as one of the lead uh, technical specialists. And then lastly, we shall have um, uh, some uh, presentation from Anne Wilson, uh, who is the currently uh, the head of the UK um, Health Security Agency International Health Regulations uh, Strengthening Project. Um, she's been recognized uh, for her leadership on um, integrated disease surveillance and response. And uh, we shall hear more about uh, some of the interesting work she's been doing across, across the globe. So without wasting time, I'll hand over to Pascal. After Pascal's presentation, we shall have um, a five minutes discussion uh, from uh, the two panelists, and then we shall open up for the Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Patrick. Just checking whether you hear me and whether you see my slides. We hear you oh. loud and clear, Pascal. 
Okay. All right. Thank you. So, so if, let, let me start by, by thanking you for inviting me uh, to present some of the work we have been doing at ESLM, also in collaboration with you. Uh, it's a little bit intimidating to present after the excellent keynote uh, presentation of, of Professor Heyman with, with all the, the, the very top science. So my, 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 my job today is actually to let you know what is going on on the ground, you know, the deep and dirty of what laboratory system and network in Africa uh, uh, are, are going through. And these are some insights for some uh, of our ASLM's uh, program. So I always like to start with some definitions and, and really what are we talking about when we say uh, laboratory network and system? So the network, we know it has that kind of pyramidal shape that really follows uh, uh, the structure of the healthcare system with at the top the most uh, sophisticated uh, uh, um, uh, facilities. And then it goes down to the community where most of the patients uh, are going to seek uh, for care. And in order for that network to actually deliver uh, its function, we have several systems that need to work, like issue systems like biosafety, biosecurity, quality workforce infrastructure, uh, uh, supply chain, etc., policy, legal, and regulatory framework. So uh, I heard one of the previous uh, um, uh, panelists say that, uh, you know, it, he said they are double face of, of the same coins. And indeed, the laboratory network, they have to provide uh, public health function and surveillance, but also clinical care. It is true that single structure that all of these very uh, important, different, but complementary function uh, would have to come out. Uh, and um, th those functions have to be done and, and really following the principle of quality, equity, uh, now the one health, and in situation of routine and emergency, I think that some of the panelists uh, mentioned that earlier. So these are really the two faces of the same coin. Uh, on, the, on the one hand, we have the patient care. On the other hand, we have the public health and health security. So what do we know about patient care in, in Africa? We know that really access to essential diagnostic is actually extremely poor. And in a, in a Lancet uh, a paper by the Lancet Commission on Diagnostic, we have heard that 19% of the community only has access to essential diagnostic and that there is a shortage of 850,000 human resources for health, for diagnostic. On the other hand, we have the public health security and the low level of preparedness or readiness uh, to outbreak response. And I think there's been a lot of attempts to kind of measure uh, you know, the level of, uh, of preparedness. And the joint external evaluation tool of the WHO has um, you know, a lot of different sections, but there are four indicators, at least in the initial version, for laboratory network. And we can see that testing for priority diseases, only 16% of the, of the country actually report no or limited capacity. So it looks like it's going quite well, but we will see in the next uh, slides uh, that the picture might be a bit different. But otherwise, for specimen referral system, which is very important for accessing diagnostic, uh, the national diagnostic network, which means that you have actually a various array of different technology from molecular testing to serology to rapid diagnostic, and the national quality system, most of the country are actually scoring extremely poorly uh, with uh, very um, uh, severe consequences. So if we talk about patient care, Something that ESLM has been doing is to um, collect GIS, uh, geolocated data on laboratories and try to understand where are the laboratories, what can they do, and what kind of population they can cover. So a few months ago, we had uh, this data from 2,150 laboratories from 15 countries in our database. And we tried to have a look of, okay, what is the tier specific level of implementation of some of the WHO recommended essential diagnostic? And you see here HIV and TB, which is far from, from the, the, the zoonoses that were presented at the beginning, but that can really represent a proxy indicator of actually what is uh, the capacity of those networks. 
So you see on the top for the HIV, uh, you have uh, here the rapid diagnostic for the screening, and we can see that at level one, two, and three, so grossly community level, intermediate, and reference, to what extent, what's the percentage of those laboratories that have uh, this, this sort of, of diagnostic. So it looks really nice. Uh, for the for the screening and then when you go uh, when we go to um, uh, viral load and early infant diagnostic uh, it, it it really starts to become uh, quite quite concerning and then for a, for a, a test like to detect cryptococ which is a very important uh, test for HIV advanced disease we see that almost no uh, laboratory have access to this kind of test so the the, the lower figure is for tuberculosis and we can see that microscopy, even though very basic, uh, we have um, half of the facilities that do not have, they do not perform um, microscopy for, for tuberculosis. And then when we go to more sophisticated bacteriology tests, we see that the availability is indeed uh, very poor. So we have tried to understand what, how do country organize um, the, the, their minimum test menu or the, the availability of essential tests across their network. So we have looked across 148 uh, different types of, of document, including the national uh, testing uh, harmonization document or TB testing HIV. So it's a complicated figure, but what I want to say here is that across the 148 document, we can see that only 30% contain information on consideration for test selection. So you can see that in two, uh, um, uh, two, three quarter of the of the of the uh, policies actually the tests are being selected to be available in the country based on, on on no evidence. So there was no when when we say evidence is evidence on disease burden. What is the workload and the staff skills that is uh, that is uh, necessary? The infrastructure that should be available at different tier level, anticipated performance of a test in a given setting option for quality assurance and supervision, and cost. So coming back to the public health uh, and, and the, the, the health security. So these are some of the tests, uh, so beyond HIV and tuberculosis, so some of the tests that can detect some of the disease. Uh, for example, Toby talked about anthrax. Uh, and, and here are some, we, we, we took uh, five countries, I think there are two in West Africa, uh, that's, that's the WA, and uh, three in Central Africa. And we tried just to map when collectively a country is capable of detecting, there's at least one facility can detect, uh, for example, anthrax by, by PCR. So when there's absolutely no capacity for detection, you see the red, when at least one facility says, well, we can detect with this sort of methodology, you have the green. So we can see that the detection of priority disease, the one earmarked for surveillance, actually, which is supposed to be good when you go on the field, it is it is actually uh, 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 quite bad. And you can see um, uh, that, for example, cholera is, is re re relatively well uh, detected, but you have countries, you, you have the, the last country there that really doesn't detect any of those uh, outbreak prone diseases. So we also uh, try to measure a little bit more accurately what is going on uh, in terms of performance and functionality of those lab network and system. And uh, you know, a few years ago, we have developed the LabNet scorecard, which is actually linked to the GE tool. And that was um, upon a, a request uh, at that time uh, from the US CDC. And it really measures uh, in, in stage, what is the capacity of a country? So here I'm showing the data from Burkina Faso who accepted to share their data. And basically you see the stage zero uh, and, and one, which is actually very limited capacity uh, you see the first assessment in 2019, you see a lot of black and, and red color, which means that there, there was almost that there was almost no capacity. But in 2022, when we did the follow up, we, we can see really a lot of improvement that you see by the color change. Um, so there is indeed a measurable improvement. Probably some of it was due to the COVID-19 because there were massive investment in countries. We don't know if that would be uh, sustainable, but we also see that some areas are very hard to improve. If you look at the areas of finance, um, 
the area of uh, um, uh, data sharing, equipment, certification and accreditation of laboratory, it's extremely difficult to make that move. So what are the common gaps in some of those countries that we evaluated? So we see that countries have a lot of difficulties to identify priority diseases, and they cannot rationally deploy diagnostic, and they can then not rationally do uh, surveillance. The capacity strengthening is pulled towards surveillance at the expense of care, and, I re and, I, and I'm very aware that this might be uh, controversial in this, um, uh, to this audience. Uh, so there is over, overall a lack of, of quality management system. So the tests that are being performed are, are not reliable. The staff is trained uh, and there are no staffing norms or targets. So we keep on training uh, the staff, but we don't know toward what kind of, you know, what's the measure of success. So there are a lot of policies and plans that are otherwise very relevant, but those plans are not funded for implementation and they are not considered by implementing partners, uh, etc. So there are a lot of of, uh, systemic issues at central level. So now I wanted also to, to, uh, to touch upon uh, some, some of the results that we obtained uh, with this Fleming Fund Regional Grant, uh, the mapping AMR and AMU partnership that we did in 14 uh, countries uh, of Africa. So really one of the most uh, worrisome uh, observation was that out of 50,000 medical laboratories across the 14 countries that participated, less than 2% of those actually performed bacteriology testing. And you can really see how uh, a little bit pointless it is even to look at the results of the surveillance out of such a small uh, a small cohort of bacteriology testing. And even when we would have um, uh, uh, data and recommendation on, on, on treatment guidelines, since diagnostic is done so, so scarcely, uh, it, it is really uh, an, an issue that needs to be addressed. So those laboratories, uh, you know, we, we surveyed a few. Uh, and, and as you can see here, a quarter, you know, only use electronic system for data reporting. Uh, most of the laboratory do not have a really a high volume of tests uh, and, and very few are uh, accredited or, or can prove that they have quality management system in their, um, in their facility. So here I'm showing a, like a map of Senegal and you see the black dots represent uh, the bacteriology uh, uh, facilities in this uh, in this country, and you can see the color. This is a population map. So the more salmonish the color is, the more uh, the the higher the density of the population. And we try to look. Okay, if those facilities, what kind of population do they cover? Uh, and 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 how much of the population would be deprived of bacteriology testing, which can be a proxy indicator of other essential tests? So we really we we calculated that uh, with taking uh, a catchment area of one hour drive or one hour walk, and what we can see is that currently. 261 million of persons are deprived of bacteriology testing in the 14 participating countries. And I have to say that Nigeria is really bringing that number uh, to uh, astronomical uh, uh, value. And if we do not do anything, then it will be half a billion of people that will be deprived of bacteriology testing by 2035 uh, if we take the population growth into consideration. So we looked at... Um, the national AMR action plan to see, okay, are there really uh, relevant interventions that are taken to, to kind of strengthen uh, the diagnostic capacity and the laboratories? And we look at the 14 uh, national action plan. And what you see in blue is actually the proportion of intervention that are actually uh, geared toward increasing uh, the number, coverage, and capacity of bacteriology lab. It is extremely limited. So the NAP uh, intervention are not commensurate uh, to the problem that we see on the ground. Now, looking a little bit about quality management system, sorry, it's a busy slide, but on the left, you see all the, 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 the accreditation bodies um, that, that provide accreditation in sub-Saharan African countries. And we looked at all the laboratories that receive an ISO 15189 accreditation, so a laboratory that can provide uh, medical testing. And across Africa, 668 laboratories were accredited in 2020. 
that's very small. So 45% are from South Africa. South Africa is very advanced, uh, less than 1% from Central Africa and less than 6% from West Africa. So this accreditation represents 1.1% of laboratory in the public sector in those 26 countries that have at least one accredited laboratories. And less than 6% of those accreditations are delivered for molecular biology, virology, and tuberculosis. And it's, it was really a surprise for us because a lot of funding for example, from the PEPFAR is going uh, to this type of laboratories. So at the end, what are the bottlenecks uh, uh, for laboratory to have the capacity to detect? From what we can see, there is a lack of relevant evidence, epidemiology and others to prioritize and to build investment case at the level of the country. The management team in those countries at the Minister of Health or maybe agriculture, uh, I didn't address uh, uh, the animal health. They have a very low capacity to, to really prepare their funding requests or their plan. And the conversation focuses on diagnostic because it's a technology instead of focusing on laboratory or at the expense of laboratory. The countries do not comply to the Abuja Declaration. 15% of the health budget should go to the laboratory, so that's already an issue. The laboratory governance is not structured, so the directorate of lab or public health lab, they have a name, they do not have a mandate. Innovations are queued toward technology and not sufficiently toward better uptake of technology for either diagnostic or surveillance. There's an insufficient representation of relevant lab stakeholders, in local, national, and regional mechanism of decision making, the laboratory is a by the way. So there are no um, uh, champion in civil society that, that are educated on the importance of laboratories. And, and you were talking about false information. And that's really because you know activists and those civil society are not aware. And the global laboratory agenda is dominated by market shaping intervention. So there's a lot of profits and, and a lot of lobbying in the way intervention are being implemented. Uh, and, and really those uh, three um, um, blocks that you see at the bottom is really something that, uh, that, that, that global uh, stakeholders and funders should really take into consideration. So I would like to stop here and acknowledge the members of my team that helped me for the analysis and to prepare this presentation. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Pascal, uh, for this uh, presentation about um, the readiness uh, to detect uh, in most of the African countries. Um, Ebola has a uh, COVID pandemic demonstrated uh, the usefulness of diagnostics in the continent. And uh, hopefully, um, you know, the leaders will start taking this seriously. Um, but we know that all is not uh, gloom. We know there have been some successes uh, in, uh, in management of um, uh, some of the epidemics and uh, that's, where I come to Peter. Uh, Peter has been involved in um, recently in the Ebola outbreak in Uganda. And um, I'll give him an opportunity to make um, a small presentation, uh, but maybe uh, you could focus it on um, uh, this question. And um, uh, what do you think is the role of evidence-based surveillance in identifying threats early, especially in resource-limited settings? And what can we do differently? Over to you, Peter. Uh, thank you, thank you, Patrick, and thank you, Pascal, for that uh, excellent, excellent presentation that has highlighted uh, the critical need to be able to strengthen the laboratory laboratory systems. And uh, I'm going to speak uh, shortly about uh, the event-based surveillance uh, system, and we know that surveillance is uh, is broadly categorized into the indicator-based and, and the event-based surveillance systems. The indicator based is really a structured system for collecting information and there are set indicators and this mostly happens in the health facility at, at facilities and uh, very good to enable you to be able to monitor trends and burdens, burden of disease and who is in, who might be affected more and it can also support you to be able to if, if you set 
thresholds, you can be able to know at a point when you're beginning to get an increase in, uh, in cases. But on the other hand, uh, the, the event-based surveillance, and uh, I think it's a critically important one because this is the part where you get to involve the community in, uh, in being able to support early, early detection. And it's really uh, being able to, to monitor signals that, that are potentially coming from different various sources that are, that are ad hoc and, and being able to, to, uh, to triage some of these signals and being able to, uh, to verify them to, to, to determine if they are events and, and setting up systems in place to be able to collect uh, and uh, collect uh, samples and, and take them to the laboratories. And this is uh, typically how it's, it's set. You, you, you need to be able as a country to, to define signals that may be sensitive and, and specific enough to help you to identify any of the, any of the uh, disease, diseases that are outbreak prone from within the community and be able to define those signals and, and identify focal people within the community who can be trained and be able to report if they identify any of those any of those signals in the community. For example, in schools, it might be as easy as saying, you know, if there is a bunch of children who are absent from, from school because of an illness, then you should be able to report. And setting up a reporting, a reporting system either through uh, the healthcare system or even having uh, electronic reporting. In Uganda, we have a, a text message system that is linked to the electronic ideas search system where people can just type and send a text to 6767. Now, this system is very critical for early, early, um, early uh, identification and detection of, uh, of outbreaks for, for a few reasons. One, we know that uh, most outbreaks really happen, happen in the community. And uh, when they happen in the community, it's quite easy for communities to be able to identify clusters of any, of any uh, sick people happening within the community or clusters of animals, animals dying within, within the community. And this is usually even much easier for, for, for communities than say hospitals. If you're in a community and you have a couple of hospitals within that community, you might get one or two people going to different hospitals and the health facility might not be able to detect uh, uh, those clusters because you have just one or two people in each facility, but within the community, they will have all those people within, within there. And, and, and these communities, and when you strengthen this, you're able to reduce the turnaround time from, from detection to laboratory confirmation of an outbreak. And more importantly, event-based surveillance uh, is critical for community, community engagement and participation. And most of you who have been in outbreaks, you know the critical importance of, uh, of the community uh, being involved in the processes. And if the, if the signals have come from the community and they have been confirmed to be an Ebola outbreak, it's much easier to convince the community that this is a disease that is within them rather than something else that might be introduced from somewhere else. So involving them in event-based surveillance is a critical and critical uh, step in actually even supporting, supporting response in, in future. Now, once this system is set up where you're able to be able to get uh, signals from hospitals, communities, animal health, laboratories, and even the media, scanning through the media. I know that the keynotes, the first keynote speaker talked about Google, using Google to be able to capture these outbreaks. These signals need to be triaged. A number of times, if you're getting a lot of signals from communities in Uganda, when you get a lot of the 6767 messages, you also get a lot of noise and you need to be able to triage. Some people can even send messages asking for directions to certain places and you need to take take those out and you need to be able to work to reduce the signals that you, you're, you're getting by identifying those key focal people in the community who are trusted, who can be able to send signals once trained. And you need to be able to have capacity at district level, if it is, turns out to be an event, to be able to send a team out to go and verify, to verify those events and set up a, and, and do a risk assessment 
And if they have collected the samples, it's very critical to be able to have a sample transportation system to get those, those uh, samples to the lab for, uh, for confirmation testing. And I just want to speak about how we are, how we are doing it different and preparing differently in, uh, in Uganda currently. So one of the things that we've taken in the country with uh, event-based surveillance is to take a One Health approach. So previously you would find the human health team is running independently and the animal health team is running independently. But recently we had, we had a, national, a national meeting where all the stakeholders were put together and the team uh, defined the key uh, priority signals for, uh, for event-based surveillance and each of the different sectors uh, agreed on these signals and they were able to to develop a joint training training materials and and this this were taken into the communities and you know when it happens in the community there's always a lot of integration within within the community because when animals die in the community or people fall sick it's the same guys who are living within that same community so the the the, the key informants within the community were actually trained uh, on all these uh, comprehensive list of, of signals and and they developed a system to be able develop a system to be able to uh, channel those signals either through the healthcare system or the animal health system and be able to or even through the the electronic EIDSR uh, platform and uh, the other the other thing that we've done differently Previously, we were having all the EIDSR systems being monitored at national level at the National Emergency Operations Center. But now what the team has decided is to decentralize the information monitoring to the regional EOCs. So we are piloting this currently in some of the, some of the regions where we have set up our regional EOCs and set up the EIDSR system to be able to monitor any signals that are coming from the community within which that regional EOC is, uh, is set up. And this is helping us to be able to overcome the delays in being able to triage and verify because they, when it's at national level, then you're getting so many, so many signals from the entire country, but this helps to, to, to create this regional uh, regional center that, that can be able to coordinate a couple of districts within, within the country. And if there's any need to, to be able to verify an event, they easily communicate, communicate with the districts. The other component that the team had to work on is to make sure that uh, we build uh, the HR capacity Peter, within the districts could, to be able to if verify. If you could so wrap I'm, up, Peter, please. Yes, I am I'm doing that here. Yeah. So uh, to be able to build the HR capacity as well as strengthen the sample transportation network, you can have an excellent laboratory, but if you're not able to get the samples from the people into the lab, then you're going to have delayed detection. And of course, thinking about whether you should be able to have a regional versus what tests can you do in the regional lab and what tests should you be able to do in the national lab and building that capacity. So this system is very critical to help us to be able to uh, detect uh, outbreaks early and it highlights the critical need for us to have the community engaged. One thing that needs to be thought about is even as we try to bring the One Health teams together, there's this elephant in the room of interoperable and interconnected surveillance systems and getting the animal health systems to speak to the human health systems. This is something that we're still grappling with because of the priorities of the different sectors. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, we've almost gone over the time, so let's try and uh, maybe catch up. We shall have a short Q and A. Uh, so, Anne, um, I understand uh, your project has been working uh, in a number of countries in Africa and Asia um, since 2016, um, doing some lab system strengthening and strengthening um, surveillance systems in uh, international health regulations. Um, could you please, uh, you know, tell us a bit, a little bit about your project and how international partners can best uh, support countries to prepare for the next pandemic. Thank you very much. 
Thank you. Yes, I'll run through this quickly, Patrick. Thank you very much. So yes, our project is an overseas development assistance project sponsored by the Department of Health and Social Care, working in a number of countries in Africa and Asia. So we have um, working in all the areas of the IHR, but we do work in the detect areas of strengthening laboratories and building surveillance and the integrated disease surveillance and response system. We work technically public health institute to public health institute and with our partners in the Ministry of Defence. So it's very much a peer to peer relationship. So it's needs driven um, and it's based on the ask. What we do in each of these countries is different depending on what the national uh, colleagues in public health have asked us to do. So in Pakistan, there's a focus on the surveillance integrated system. In Nigeria, there's a lot of work going on in laboratories. So there are over 80 people now working on the project, the majority of whom are sitting in the countries we're in. And during COVID, because those folk were there, our staff were there, they were able to sit alongside and work alongside public health colleagues during COVID to learn what um, any of the gaps were in terms of the work we had been doing and how it was being used in, in an emergency like COVID. The three points I want to make, so I'll make up a lot of time for you here, hopefully. The three points I wanted to make in terms of how can international partners best support countries to prepare for the next pandemic, I would actually change that and rephrase it to say, we actually need to support each other. We have to learn from each other. There's still an awful lot of attitude of how we can um, support other countries, but we're not as receptive to how we've learned. And in our project, we have learned so much by what our partners have done with very, very limited resources. So it's very much about two-way sharing and learning. The other point I would make, and I feel quite strongly about, with all these initiatives and all the post-COVID work that is being done, we as partners, international partners, need to collaborate better. It's not just about lip service, it's about helping. And as Pascal said, there is so much for countries that have they have to do, they don't know where to start. So we as partners should come together much more strongly so that instead of having a disparate like pieces of the jigsaw with individual pieces of work that we do, if we come together based on the priority needs of the country, the systems will be stronger and therefore more sustainable. The last point and the most important point and the thing that I've learned so much, especially when I started the ideas of our work in Pakistan, is that we need to recognize the importance of context. And Toby, I think you said you're being controversial about what's happening on the ground. I'm a job being public health practitioner or consultant. I'm not an academic, I'm not a researcher, but the big, big learning for me is that the understanding of the context and the systems into which we are bringing that support, you have to spend time on focusing on the, here are all these tools, very good, very useful, here's all this guidance, but how do you actually apply it on the ground? And that's where folk like us who've had the privilege of working in public health systems for a long, long time, where it's all about asking those questions, well, how do I do this with all these tools? We can then sit alongside our partners who bring that knowledge of the system and their expertise technically to help us then work together to be able to focus better on the support that we give. And that only happens through committing longer term and to have trusted public health relationships, which lead to more impactful support. Um, I'll finish there. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Anne. I couldn't have summarized it better. Um, collaboration, coordination, partnership, and listening to each other are very important facets in this area. So um, we shall just have two questions from uh, the audience uh, because of the time. Um, if there are any questions, uh, please pass over the mic and then uh, we shall close this session. Thank you. Hi, my name is Rebecca Maudling. I'm an um, independent One Health consultant. Um, it was really interesting to hear about the event-based surveillance system in Uganda, which is taking a One Health approach. And PT touched on some of the challenges of that. Um, and I think they've been touched on elsewhere and that there is a difference in respect given to the knowledge and expertise of different professions. Um, I've seen it myself between kind of vets and, and human medics. And my question really is, how do we break down the barriers of status, bias and power um, between the professions and encourage fresh 
thinking around public health that isn't just anthropocentric. Thank you. Like, can I make one? I, I, think, uh, I think the professionals at the top level need to just borrow a leaf from the, from the community. And this happens a lot, even throughout this, the health systems, when we talk about integration and you find services that are, are integrated at lower levels, but upper levels, they are run in silos. There's need to talk more with the different groups. There's need to collaborate more, but also more importantly, there's a need to be able to understand each other's perspective. I think in some of the meetings, the One Health meetings that have sat in Uganda, you come in and the animal health team is saying, you know, these are the priority diseases for us. And uh, these are not really important for the human health guys. And then the human health guys are having priorities that are not important to the animal health guys. So there's a lot more conversation that needs to happen between the teams and people being able to see the other's perspective and appreciating where they're coming from. I think that will help us to, to be able to break down the different barriers and probably uh, tone down on egos on either side. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, Pascal and Anne, do you have anything else to add? And then maybe we can close this session. Thank you. Uh, well, I would just add, it's about back to relationships. So the re relationship is between the different sectors. And some of the work we've done on multi-sectoral coordination in our project, you think you know the other sector, but you don't actually know the other sector. And spending time building that relationship and understanding what the other sector does and coming to respect their input to this um, response helps to build that. And, and that moves you towards a more uh, equitable um, respect for each other. That's what I have found in the many years I've been working in multi-sector and internationally. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I, I agree with everything. What, what I would like to add is, is sometimes when you work um, at the technical and operational level, the lack of clarity about man mandates, roles and responsibilities of some, you know, uh, in relationship to the others can actually, uh, you know, promote this kind of, of, of neglect of a, a little bit of a uh, of, of arrogance of, or, of, or some divisions or units uh, uh, between ministries or, or even within one, one division of the, of the ministry. So uh, yeah, clear mandates, roles and responsibilities from the year. Um, thank you, Peter, Pascal yes. and um, Anne. Um, is there any other question? Oh, yes. Okay, uh, uh, is... the last question, please. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Brilliant presentation right there. Um, I think during the last pandemic, the voices of uh, millions of African, hundreds and millions of African were not really well covered by the global media. So that's why I think it's very, very uh, important for me to ask these questions today. So I'd like to know your response. What's your answer to the significant numbers of... Uh, Africans that said during last pandemic that the last the pandemic was just a rich man's problem, that Africa has more pressing issues like industrialization, investing in industrialization, transformation of the raw materials that are abundant in the continent to create more jobs, to the problems of brand drains to attract all the best brands the African best brand that are working in big organizations around the world to come back to the continent because there's something, there's industrialization and serious funding going right there to create more jobs and opportunities for Africans in Africa. What's your take on that? Thank you. Um, thank you very much. I never got your name, but um, Anne, Peter, Pascal, over to you uh, and any other person in the audience. Pascal? Yeah, thank you. I can I can take that one. I mean, I, I 
it, it's, it's a fair comment. I think that we also have to recognize that during the COVID-19 pandemic, really there was, there was a very strong African leadership, I think coming from Africa CDC, from all those researchers uh, that were putting data out there on the, on the, on the SARS-CoV-2 uh, variants. So I, I personally found that it was an opportunity for Africa to show uh, their capacity for, for research and, uh, response and, and for solidarity, because there was really a, a great solidarity between all the African countries. And I don't think that in every continent uh, it happened the same. Uh, I think that what you mentioned, that there are other problems, uh, th that is true. Uh, and, and what I would like to point out is that is the lack of capacity to actually collect data on our own uh, epidemics and, and, and our own disease burden that, you know, it's always, it's always an ad hoc ex exercise. And I think that if we strengthen our capacity to generate data that actually show what are our real burden of disease uh, and, and act accordingly to make our own agenda, that, that would really be a, a progress. Okay, um, I think um, that's it from this session. Um, thank you very much. Uh, detection is a very important aspect and uh, we need to strengthen our capacities um, in the continent um, and other all over the world. Uh, this session has really showcased what is happening on the ground. Um, the interplay between uh, professionals in terms of One Health uh, collaboration, uh, but also how to uh, to work with governments and uh, the difficulties in uh, data sharing and uh, which will uh, now come to response um, the next session. So I would like to thank Pascal, Peter and Anne for your time and uh, over to you, Toby. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Patrick, Pascal, Anne and Peter. Um, our last session is... Yeah, it's, uh, the um, presentations are not coming up on here. So it's probably better to be in that direction. Um, um, moderated by our, our very own Katrina Waddington, um, who can introduce herself. Um, and this is the last session. And without further ado, I will hand over to you, Katrina. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Yeah, so uh, contrary to what David Heyman said, it's not um, prevent, detect, prevent. It is uh, respond. And we have a session on respond now. Thank you very much. Yeah, as you said, my name is Katrina Waddington. I work on the Fleming Fund. I chair the, um, the external advisory committee, the expert advisory committee. And uh, for my sins, I'm a, a health economist, which could be a whole different session. So we have the same format for, for this session. First of all, we're going to hear from Dr. Jerome Kim, whom I'm sure needs no introduction to many of you. Dr. Jerome is the Director General at the IVI, the International Vaccine Institute. So to start off, Dr. Jerome will talk for, for 10 minutes or so. Then we've got two commentators who will join me here afterwards, Dr. Neil Ebenezer, who comes from the Department of International Trade. And I had to write down your job title, Neil, um, from Medical Technology and Genomics Specialist at the Department of International Trade. Great job title, really. And then finally, we have um, Dr. Nick Lobel Weiss, um, who's a health emergency response expert. He's most recently worked in the global health security part of the um, FCDO and has worked on uh, emergency responses here in London in New York, in Haiti, and in Liberia. So I'm hoping we have Dr. Jerome online. Good afternoon. Good morning, Dr. Jerome. Uh, good afternoon. Um, this Can you is hear us? Yes, so please, over to you. Welcome. Thank you. Um, thank you, Katrina. And thank you for the opportunity to speak on pandemic preparedness and response uh, from the inequities to the 100-day mission not working. Um, here we go. These are my disclosures. So inequities really characterize this um, pandemic. And, you know, the there's recently been a, a comment produced in The Lancet um, from, from actually a, a panel of, of individuals 
um, really kind of bringing home some of the key uh, issues around it. And I'll, I'll summarize those at the end, but let's just go through the inequities. They fall into five categories, diagnostics inequity, R&D funding inequity, manufacturing inequity, vaccine supplier distribution inequity, and then vaccination inequity. And each of these has a particular issue. None of them have really been resolved. I, we talked about, and, and the previous speakers talked about the importance of detection. You can't um, care. You, you may not care about an epidemic or a, a pandemic disease that you don't know the extent of or the burden of. If you don't think that it's affecting the population, you won't necessarily be concerned. There was a $2 billion gap in diagnostics, and, and I'll leave that um, to, to another person to discuss. The research and development funding inequity actually gets to a, another very important concern around the way we allocate money for the research and development of vaccines for pandemic diseases. The third issue is uh, manufacturing. And manufacturing is uh, distributed primarily in high-income countries, North America, Europe, and then China and India. And there was a con there was a problem, and we're trying to work through that problem, and, and that'll come up a bit in, in the discussion. The fourth inequity is around vaccine distribution and supply. And we have the ACT Day Accelerator. It really did try to invent a new mechanism to distribute vaccine, but it didn't really work as well as as it could. And the um, and the and a, an impartial review of Act A, depending on your perspective, is either a glass half empty or a glass half full. But the um, but many of the conclusions were negative that it did not do what we had hoped that it would do. That does not mean that it can, that these problems cannot be addressed. And the final issue is around inequity in vaccination. And this gets to a point that I'll make with a with a different slide. <clears throat> But who doesn't believe in equity? I mean, we talk about it all the time. We think that it's really important. Actually, what's shown in the box is um, the use of RNA vaccines um, in, in different parts of, or sorry, where the vaccines that were used in different parts of the world came from. And you can see that, that depending on the country, a lot of the vaccines, 100% of the vaccines came from the USA or Europe, or um, a significant number came from China, Russia, or India. And again, you know, this distribution inequity was one symptom of things, uh, something called vaccine nationalism, IP nationalism and patents. And here uh, you see the geopolitics around vaccines in Nepal, sitting between China and India. The bottom line here is that we've never been good about equity in vaccines. And this just shows the DTP3 coverage uh, in the United States. That's the red line. It was about 90% back in 1980. What you see in the red and blue lines are what w, uh, what UNICEF estimates the use of DTP3 is in, in other countries of the world. And this gap, this 30-year gap in equity is what we're talking about. And it's a problem that we need to fix, not only for pandemics, but for all time. The distribution of manufactured vaccine was not it was not equitable. You can see this is the most recent data from our world in data. 73.6% of people in low-income countries remain unvaccinated. On the other hand, nearly 70% of the world has gotten at least one dose. So we've done better, but there's still a huge gap. In a sense, when we reached the September of 2021, we were already at a, a situation where there were 10 billion doses of vaccine made. By the end of the year, it was 12 or 13 billion. We could not vaccinate enough people. In a sense, equity was more challenging than simply the supply of vaccines. And this is a statement on, on COVAX being an important success, but only a partial success. Failure to bridge the, the equity gaps had an impact, and that's cost. The inequity cost was estimated by the National Board of Economic Review of the United States at four to five trillion dollars. Um, estimated by UNDP, uh, total cost of the pandemic twenty three trillion dollars. You know, we all often think about GDP uh, as the as the measure of impact, but if you look at the cost of fiscal supplements, the statistical value of lives lost, and the total generational impact of educational costs. One group of, of economists came up with a really remarkable number. If you estimate that the total GDP in 2019 mm, was about $137 trillion, the cost of the pandemic over time is actually pretty close to that. Maybe 98% of 
137 trillion dollars if you look at all the potential costs so inequity and pandemics have a tremendous cost but they also have an impact the inability to vaccinate good parts of the world resulted in the generation of mutants. So remember, outbreaks make variants, variants make outbreaks, and this vicious cycle has continued. You see the pattern in South Africa of outbreaks and variants and outbreaks and variants <coughs> going through Omicron. We know that COVID vaccination saved lives. The estimate is that vaccination saved 20 million lives. COVAX of those 20 million lives, COVAX, the mechanism to distribute vaccine around the world may have saved 7 million. It could have saved 10.7 million. So a significant number of people may have unnecessarily died because they did not have equitable access to vaccines. And remember, WHO wasn't trying to vaccinate all of the world. They were trying to vaccinate 20%, the highest risk people and healthcare workers. So just not being able to do that resulted in an additional 3 million lives being lost. 8.2 million preventable deaths in total, the cost of inequity and missed targets for vaccination. So against that, we have a new formula, the CEPI 100-day mission. So it's not 100 days to the manufacture of 10 billion doses of vaccine. It's going from the identification of a pathogen, the sequence, to having vaccine emergency use approved within 100 days. To think about this, you have to think about having funding, being ready from a regulatory perspective, being able to assess the vaccines that are under consideration. You have to have platforms, RNA platform, DNA platform, protein platforms, and others. You need to have participatory practices that will allow you to enroll 30 to 60,000 people as quickly as possible. Engage them in the clinical trial with the best kind of ethical protections that we can provide. All of this requires an effort. The 100-day strike force is, is something that we really need to focus on if we want to get the vaccines out more quickly. Of course, everyone knows Funding makes innovation both real and fast. And you can see the $23 billion spent by the European Union, the $18.73 billion spent by the United States in Operation Warp Speed. This allowed unprecedented speed to the demonstration of safety and efficacy of our vaccines. And you can see the compressed schedules. But one of the remarkable things is the funding from CEPI, the funding from the United States, the funding from the European Union didn't go to the groups that actually manufacture 70% of the world's vaccines by volume. So what you see in the left panel is uh, by revenue. So GSK has by far the greatest revenue for a vaccine company. But if you look at production of doses, Serum Institute of India is way above GSK. Did Serum Institute do anything other than make AstraZeneca's vaccine? What would have happened if they had gotten $30 million up front to develop a vaccine as quickly as possible? Would we have had more doses of safe and efficacious vaccines? Well, we'll never know. Because among these developing country manufacturers that make 70% of the world's vaccines, their uh, cumulative amount of funding from the Western funders that funded pandemic uh, vaccine development was almost zero. To, to fix that, we now have an unprecedented effort to develop regional manufacturing. So these are the regional manufacturing projects announced just in the last two years for Africa. You can see multiple countries have uh, capability. If you looked at the map and, and said, but which of these countries can actually approve a vaccine produced in the country? Only two, Egypt and South Africa. The rest of the countries don't have the ability to approve vaccines made in the country, which means that if you had a vaccine, if you had a factory, if you had the right R&D and you made a vaccine, would you be able to use a vaccine developed in Uganda in the rest of the world? And the answer is probably no. What you see on the right side is the enormous amount of funding that's been allocated to do this. We're looking at roughly $5 billion in the funding that we know of that's been committed to the development of manufacturing in Africa. But manufacturing isn't the only part of what we need to do. And really the development of an end-to-end R&D ecosystem that goes all the way from the laboratory, through clinical testing, through manufacturing, and all the way to impact is what's really gonna be needed if we're gonna fix the problem with the distribution of manufacturing. 
regulate regulatory agencies need to become efficient. And they were, FDA, EMA, and others were very efficient. There were expedited pathways uh, that were developed during COVID. These need to be formalized and made to be a part of the standard pandemic response. The assessment of the vaccines, also very critical. You know, we were lucky in a sense that we could use PCR for COVID. If we didn't have access to that, what would we be doing? I mean, one um, old time vaccinologist joked, you know, if we had PCR during measles, we wouldn't say the vaccine is 95% efficacious. I mean, we have uh, unprecedented access, but we need to develop the assays in order to do the right testing to know that vaccines are safe and efficacious. The assessment is critical. And I'm using as an example what happened to AstraZeneca, where a half dose was accidentally used. That half dose was even more effective than the full dose. And, and it turns out that if you gave the dose spaced even wider than four weeks apart, the vaccine was more efficacious. The issues around dose selection and interval are really critical for the development of vaccines under normal circumstances. We don't often have the luxury of time during a pandemic, but this is something that we need to come back to as we look at vaccines uh, globally. Perils of platforms. Platforms are amazing, they're wonderful, and they really allow us to accelerate things because regulatory agencies will look at a platform, say RNA or DNA, and say, we, we know this platform is safe. So we can go ahead and do concurrent review. You can submit documents in real time. We'll look at them as they come in. If it's a new platform, if it's a new substance, say a, um, a live attenuated COVID vaccine, things slow down. And when that happens, we potentially lose time and time is lives. Turning a platform into a vaccine turns a concept into reality. All of this needs to be done before the pandemic strikes. Participation. We need to enroll people, which means that we need to engage the population. They need to understand why the vaccines are being tested. They have to understand that we're not using them as guinea pigs. This is something that we need. And in, by and large, companies and organizations, countries were able to mobilize enough people to test vaccines between you know, 20,000 to 60,000 individuals uh, for different vaccine trials. Really a remarkable thing. Will we always be able to do that? Unclear. Is it something that we need to work on? Something called good participatory practices? Yes. Are there guidelines for it? Yes. Is this something that we need to work on as we develop plans for the next pandemic? Yes. Finally, ethics. The ethics of human subjects is, is actually tied in to something that is of critical importance now, which is access to vaccines after the, the phase three trials. You know, it took a long time for those vaccines to reach low and middle income countries, countries where we tested the vaccine. Should there be access agreements in order to achieve equity and justice in the, in the use of these vaccines that we're testing in populations all over the world? I think that the answer to this is yes. And some of the, the comments that were made, the building blocks for the, for the next pandemic are really uh, to the point on this subject. IVI, we didn't have our own vaccine. So we just, we helped other organizations around the world, 24 in, in all, from everything from strengthening clinical sites to do vaccine research, doing clinical trials, doing effectiveness trials, doing animal testing and animal challenge studies. In the end, the vaccines that we worked on um, resulted in a billion doses being donated to COVAX or being provided to the COVAX facility. And that, that's what we did using everything that we had. So one, one final comment on this Lancet paper, six building blocks for the next pandemic. In order to achieve equity, we need to have regional R&D hubs equipped for last mile innovation. We have to have commitments on government governance and financing for these common goods, which are the vaccines for pandemic outbreaks. We need to have sufficient numbers of independent clinical trials networks can, that can execute these vaccine trials according to good clinical practices. We need to have surveillance and burden in the countries all over the world where outbreaks could occur. Uh, and it could be in the United States, but it could very well be in South Asia or Southeast Asia or Sub-Saharan Africa. And the networks need to be there to be able to diagnose this. We need to have strengthened capacity for regional manufacturing. Again, a really critical part of the $5 billion that's been set aside to do this. Finally, we need an inclusive, transparent, accountable system uh, of governance and management. And this means that we need partnerships. And this is going to be a really critical part of, um, of what we do in the future. Thank you.
Gosh, thank you so much, Dr. Jerome. I think it's just, it's so pr profound what you're saying. I think you could be talking to, uh, I sometimes wish you were talking to, you know, groups of politicians and, and philosophers and um, sociologists and whatever about this thing about equity that we can argue about what equity is, but then epidemiology tells us something else about its, its importance. So really, really profound thought. Thank you very much. Um, so without any further ado, I'll pass over to you, Neil. And if ever you wanted an introduction about the importance of international trade uh, in this, then, then that case has been well made. Over to you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, so my name is Neil Ebenezer. I'm in the life sciences team at the Business and Department for Business and Trade. And what we do there is really um, look at supporting UK companies to take the goods that they manufacture to overseas markets. We also look at companies from abroad looking to come into the UK. And so, you know, when we're looking at this issue of the response to what we've heard just now, I would say it's worth just taking a step back and looking at the way the UK responded to the, um, to the sort of threat from COVID and how it looked at its resources, whether it was through research and development, through to clinical trials, through to regulatory processes, and obviously the development of the first uh, dose of the vaccine in this country. So in this section, I will try to highlight some of the areas that the UK has been working with. I'm not acting as if it's perfect, mm -hmm. but these are the sorts of things that we try to do when we're trying to take it abroad. And we developed a brochure which sort of looked at some of the successes from the sort of COVID um, sort of uh, the response to the COVID uh, vaccine, uh, COVID um, uh, pandemic, which is available to people if they require it, and we can share those links. Uh, we've heard today that, you know, pandemics are a recurring global health challenge, but the UK, we thought, is quite well positioned to contribute to global preparedness. And I think we heard from Anne that no one person can do it themselves, no one country can do it themselves, but it is really about partnership. And you know, learning and sharing information is going to be really key. And, but I think where we have strength and depth is around you know, a very uh, vibrant healthcare and life science sector, uh, which is able or was able to respond to this. So you know, from moving from say 10,000 diagnostics tests to the hundreds of thousands to millions of tests that they were doing per day. And that scaling of it was quite extraordinary at the level uh, for a country of the size. Um, but I think it might be worth looking at some of the UK solutions a little bit and then how they try to take that a bit further. So if you look at the solution set covers three main areas. So it was about infection prevention and control, disease prevention, and then about management and wider support to healthcare systems. And some of the latter is very easily translatable to other geographies. And we can break this down a little bit further. So we can look at solutions for infection prevention control, diagnostic testing, genomics testing and surveillance. And we look at genomics test sequencing, not just of the vaccine, but of the populations. There are issues there that arise about inequity, when we know that the majority of um, the sequencing for the human genome has come from white Caucasian uh, rather than African or Asian populations. And this has a real impact. Mm -hmm. So if we're gonna do this differently, we need <clears throat> to do this in terms of the surveillance that goes on that we heard very much about, but actually uh, concerted efforts to try to readdress some of these wrongs. And we, can, we have the facilities in the UK in terms of Genomics England, which has looked at this at length. So, you know, the, the, the structures in place to allow us to do this, but to also share the approaches we've taken and how we use patient data, things like the trusted research environments and so forth to do that. And through this, I'll focus a little bit on genomics to try to take one area out of this big thing. Uh, but if you go through that, you know, we talk about disease prevention management. So research and development has been really key. The manufacturing processes would not have happened if we didn't have the clinical trials in place. So when we're looking at things from the National Institute for Health Research and the clinical trials units, the, the ability to be agile and adapt and move things towards the focus for uh, COVID and things that we say, for instance, with DMSO, uh, a product that was already in the market, but showed to be effective. So if there's the agility of some of the systems that we had in place in the UK that allowed that to happen. And I think when you're looking at supporting healthcare systems, we've seen a lot around digital health, remote monitoring, 
But then there was the uh, ventilator challenge. Uh, fortunately, the, the disease had changed. It maybe wasn't called for in the end, but it was the rapid response where you got different actors coming together to actually create those ventilators at scale that was really unprecedented. Um, and so, you know, the ability to do that shows the, uh, the knowledge base, the engineering, the manufacturing, that's not just unique to the UK, but if we could use those same processes and look at that in an international way, we have shared learning. And yet again, I think uh, a speaker earlier said, you know, it's not just one way. We can learn from others and others can learn from us. But I think collaboration around this is really quite key. Um, so the UK has tried to build an end-to-end -end ecosystem to try to you know, accelerate genomic research, to deliver genomic healthcare that benefits patients and innovation. And when we're looking at the detect, prevent, and respond to pandemic threats, genomic surveillance is, going to, is an effective and essential tool. And I think we've heard from UK HSA today. I think there's a lot of work that they're doing in that space as well. So you know, there's also the UK Centre for Pandemic Preparedness, and this was launched as part of the UK's contribution to developing a global early warning system to detect new infectious disease threats, as well as trying to make uh, more sense of the new variant assessment platform and so forth. I'm just mindful of time, I might be going too long. Well, yes. <laughs> so, so I'll try to. So maybe what I'll just do is have a bit of a slip. So I think we've talked about very much about, you know, vaccine deployment strategy, national immunization, management services, healthcare, workforce, education and training, clinical service, consultancy, regulation, guidelines and support. I think if you just bullet point those, I think mm. those would be quite good to highlight. Lastly, to say that, you know, there is um, a, a funding that's hosted by this. So there's the UK's part of a consortium looking at, it's the World Bank, Financial Intermediary Fund that's looking at uh, funding in this sort of space. So the UK contributed last year 25 million to this. I know the fund needs to be much larger, but it's a contribution. Um, and to say that this meeting is also very timely. So thanks to Chelsea for organizing. Uh, the Common Science and Technology Committee in December announced a new inquiry into government's preparedness for emerging disease with pandemic potential. Following the largest ever outbreak of avian flu in December, uh, with wild birds and domestic birds. And so the inquiry will look at emerging diseases and learnings from COVID-19. And, um, you know, there's a call out. So if you want to give evidence to that, please do so. Uh, I think you can submit evidence until Friday, 31st of March. And then the last bit was to actually say that there was uh, some funding, if I got the right piece of paper somewhere there. Right? Um, but there was a piece of funding from the British Academy on pandemic preparedness. Um, but if people are going to apply, they need to get their skates on because it's the 22nd of Feb. <laughs> <laughs> but I just thought I'd mention that. So thank you. Well, Dr. Jerome has just told us, you know, we all need to be quicker in our responses. So. <laughs> well, yeah. so thank you very much. And Chelsea, maybe the, the, the call for responses and that funding thing, maybe we could circulate information about both that you could share with them. Yeah. yeah, thanks very much. And that was actually a timely reminder of the sort of multifacetedness of the, the um, response, isn't it? When you said ventilators, I suddenly realised there was a whole story I'd, I'd kind of forgotten about. So um, as an expert in emergency responses, um, over to you next. I remember with ventilators, there used to be a planning assumption in the UK long before COVID that we needed to have 25,000, uh, just 25,000 ventilators separately on hand. And the challenge was always that even um, executives in the National Health Service um, said that why, how can we spend money to commit to stockpiling ventilators when that's going to impact our resources to um, provide patient care? And that um, brings about something that we um, sort of a challenge in government that I, you know, where I've been working to very recently, that we have a challenge in government that we, you know, I guess we attribute it to Jeremy Bentham. People may know the Benthamite principle where we're trying to achieve, paraphrasing, the best result for, for the largest number of people. And we force ourselves sometimes to make tough choices where, um, or to consider tough choices of how can we best use our resources and UK aid that UK government's considered a very principled and reasoned donor. But as someone that's worked within um, that system for some time now, I would actually offer this controversial view as well, that um, 
we don't always need to choose. We don't necessarily always need to choose between what is the most, um, uh, you know, we want always want to seek the best value for money, but at the same time, uh, a response, just like preparedness and prevention, these things are expensive and they have great utility. And, you know, we talk about, there was great, we were speaking earlier about the great successes of the, um, of the uh, response to the Sudan virus uh, uh, strain of Ebola in Uganda and the region recently. And um, I believe it was, I forget, and it was declared over a few, uh, just maybe just over a month ago. But even though that um, outbreak did end, um, there were still, I think it was 77 um, people that died. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember anecdotally, and uh, my colleague from Baylor might remember, not only that, but I remember at the very end of this one, we were seeing very few deaths from, uh, from Ebola. There was a woman who was an Ebola survivor, but she was pregnant. And it, it so turned out that her baby, when she gave birth, ended up being another case and a fatal case at that. And, um, and I guess what it's important to remember that you know, these numbers, there's, and especially Dr. Kim and, and the numbers that he described, these numbers um, translate to people and it is expensive and it's important. And we need to, we do need to commit resources. We need to commit resources and not just um, think about how we apportion them and whether we focus on more than one than the other. We need to, we need to be prepared to commit money for responses. And I should say it's not for a pandemic, but we're well. We're responding right now. Um, the UK emergency medical team I used to direct at FCDO is responding to um, to uh, cholera in um, uh, uh, Malawi right now, and um, and that's a challenge. And then at the same time, you know what? We're also responding to the earthquake in Turkey. And you know, um, when there are problems in the world, the world calls us. The world calls the UK and they rely on us to respond. And we do, and we step forward. And even in these challenging times, we need to remember that it's important to appropriate the resources for that. So what do we do? How are we prepared for the next pandemic? We think in advance. We think about, um, uh, you know, detection, preparedness or um, prevention, detection, and response. We think about... Um, a colleague, Tom Frieden, um, who used to be the director of the C uh, Centers for Disease Control in the United States, who has um, put forward a concept of 717. I don't know if people have heard this, where, it would, where you'd seek to detect um, an outbreak of a disease within seven days of it occurring naturally or in the population. And then one day, 24 hours, to alert everyone that you need to about the, um, the uh, outbreak. And then to mount, maybe not complete, but to mount an effective response within that seven, first seven days after you've alerted. That, um, approaching that mission, as well as the 100-day mission that uh, Dr. Kim mentioned earlier, these are important um, standards that we can really hold ourselves to. And I guess the only other thing in realizing, you know, the time is um, at a premium now, is again echoing uh, um, what Anne mentioned uh, earlier, what Dr. Wilson mentioned, is that um, mm -hmm. collaboration, that's one thing that I think the UK does, unlike anyone else, uh, any any other donor on the planet in ways, is that we really want to hear from um, our, you know, our partners on the ground. We um, we want to get somewhere quickly, but we, we want to um, engage with them in how we provide the support. We want to, um, you know, through a, programs that are in development at FCDO, we want to have health system strengthening that empowers institutions. We talk about, uh, you know, what we were talking about earlier with Africa and the importance of, of having Africa be ready. We need to meet the call of Africa's new public health order, and which means that we need to, that Africa needs to be able to manufacture its own vaccine therapeutics and diagnostics and should collaborate with the world, but needs to be able to do that and will confidently will do that themselves. And then the final thing going is to have a really strong public health emergency workforce. And we need to not just train people and, and build their capacity, 
but we need to empower the HR, which I think someone mentioned. We need to make sure that they can get hired and they can get paid and so that they can work at the border checkpoints in Uganda, which we had invested in years ago. And then when there was an Ebola outbreak, um, no one had been paying for themselves. Mm. Or quick, large whistles. No, fascinating. Thank you. And you know, when you were speaking, I suddenly thought, gosh, I think I have been that person on a health board saying we can't afford to, to stockpile I, ventilators. And it made me think it's something about earmarking and saying we just have to have a separate earmark because you can't ask people to, to, to choose between the immediates. So thank you very much. Um, are there any questions online? No? Okay. Any questions in the room? Yeah, sir? <coughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is Richard Wabin, and I'm a, an ME bioethics and medical law student at St. Mary's University. Um, I think uh, I've, I've, I've heard a, a lot from the speakers and I was really impressed by um, the presentations. And my question is um, from, from a bioethics perspective, um, uh, looking at the, the three core uh, uh, um, uh, 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 the three core aspects of bioethics, um, uh, respect for persons, uh, autonomy, and uh, beneficence, and then justice. Um, uh, how do we um, incorporate ethics into uh, our, our, our pandemic response? How do we emphasize on ethics, bioethics? How do we emphasize on it? Because um, we can see how um, the last speaker, when he was presenting, mentioned ethics, bioethics, how do we, we use we use people as, a, um, uh, I wouldn't say guinea pigs, but we test uh, um, vaccines on them. But in terms of priority, in terms of prioritizing people, eth uh, equity and all of that, we don't. So how do we incorporate ethics into our, our pandem pandemic response? Thank you. What a great question. Dr. Kim, did you manage to hear that? Yes, I did. It's a very complicated question. Um, from a, at a societal level, um, the issue of human rights and COVID actually was taken up um, in a very interesting paper by Gostin in The Lancet. Uh, and, and when you think about the intersections between what we should have done and what we did, um, you, you can kind of see at a, at a grand scale, not clinical trial ethics, uh, but around human rights and ethics, um, that, that, that we really didn't do it right. Um, from a clinical trials perspective, again, you know, um, having done phase three trials uh, and, and led them, you know, in Thailand and where there was real concern about um, this idea of being a human guinea pig, it really gets down to the real principles of how we consent people. I mean, people volunteer for clinical trials. So we call it, we don't call them subjects, we call them volunteers. And they have to be informed of the risks of participation. And they have to be informed of, you know, the potential benefit. And of course, we have to tell them, we don't know that this vaccine works. We don't know that it will protect you. And it may actually make you more susceptible to infection. All of these are a part of it. When you do an HIV vaccine trial, you actually have to often get, uh, make people take a test of understanding to ensure that they really do understand the risks. And then to get to the other parts of uh, beneficence and justice, again, you know, and I think this is something, you know, often when we're doing phase three trials on a routine basis, you know, the usual five to 10 year cycle of, of getting vaccines out, you know, we think, well, in the end, we have an RSV vaccine that's going to save hundreds of thousands of lives, not only of babies, but of, uh, of the elderly. And in the end, this will be applied and given to people who are in the target population, according to the target product profile that's approved by the MHRA or the FDA or EMA. But what we don't think is that the other side of this is access to innovation is something that, that is increasingly important. And, and I'm not going to go so far as to, to necessarily say that you know, these global goods have to be manufactured at, a, at no cost to you know, everybody, but there needs to be access through different mechanisms for these things that are um, really for the common good. And we haven't figured that out yet. And you know, there's going to be a lot of work around the revisions um, or the replacement uh, to Act A, the uh, acceleration of COVID tools, um, the COVID tools accelerator, 
uh, which is really uh, was a really key part of the response to the pandemic, which didn't necessarily work in the way we wanted it to work. But again, you know, this was something that was constructed in a hurry to deal with, you know, problem that we saw uh, potentially coming. <clears throat> so I, I think to answer your your very complicated question, uh, clinical trial ethics are one thing, and you know the companies, the organizations that conduct clinical trials according to good clinical practices are compelled to follow ethical practices as, as they apply to um, the volunteers in the trial. And the bigger picture around the human rights and ethics around vaccines and access to vaccines, you know, the idea of, is there really justice? If, you know, in three fourths of the world, uh, people haven't seen a single dose of COVID vaccine. And, and I think that's a question that not only high income countries, but low and middle income countries need to address as well, because um, you know the ability to deliver vaccines in the end was one of the rate limiting steps, something rate limiting steps, something that the Tony Blair Institute called the absorptive capacity issue. Um, and we knew that that was a problem and we knew that health systems needed strengthening. And while we were pushing so hard and spending $40 billion to develop vaccines that were safe and efficacious, should we have spent some of that money ensuring that when the vaccines were available, that they would be able to be administered, that we could overcome uh, vaccine hesitancy, that we could increase trust and acceptance of vaccines. I mean, all of these things were a part of the end-to-end -end considerations because in the end, so this is something our, one of my professors taught us way a long, long time ago. Vaccines don't save lives, vaccination saves lives. And at the end, it's all about impact. And the injection of that, that vaccine into the arm of a recipient that will protect them against disease or infection. Do you want to thank you very much? You're a student of ethics. Do you want to do you want to add anything to that? Is it something that struck you as you were talking? Oh, I, I, I think uh, he, he has mentioned um, uh, uh, all that I, I, I needed, that needed to be to be uh, you know. Talked about. I I just I just wish uh, as as uh, I'm a Ghanaian from Ghana, and um, I think we also had issues with uh, um, uh, vaccine delivery where we um, uh, ordered about let's say the hundred percent vaccines that we needed. We only got ten percent, and which which is that's a huge gap. There's a lot of uh, um, 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 and monies have been paid. Mm -hmm. That's what I, I heard. Monies have been paid. Now, look, uh, if you think about all this, uh, uh, um, some people have been prioritized. Some have, um, you know, some people have just been, you know. So it's it's something that I think we we all, as uh, talking about one health, we all need to come together, collaborate, and uh, um, push forward this agenda, uh, um, the one health agenda. Because um, it it to me it appears we've not learned anything from previous pandemics, and uh, I I hope uh, through this forum and other uh, um, uh, avenues we can all uh, um, um, champion One Health and push for collaborations. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think that- right, Sorry, can I make uh, one comment um, on that? <laughs> so, you know, the I, and, and just to remind people, you know, we had the COVID pandemic, not all pandemics are the same. We're still in the seventh cholera, global cholera pandemic that started in 1961. So the outbreak in Malawi is just, the most recent manifestation of something that's been a real problem. 22 African countries are having cholera outbreaks and there's not enough vaccine. And I know because our institute developed the vaccine that was technology transferred to all the companies in the world that make it um, with no royalties, no patent, no nothing. It was done for, for global good. But we have these problems. We have tools. We don't have enough of them. And part of what we need to do, I mean, in the UK, you had an outbreak of uh, scarlet fever and deaths from scarlet fever. Group A streptococcus kills 500,000 people a year. There is still not a vaccine anywhere, high income or low income, because no one cares. Uh, but 500,000 deaths a year, every year. Um, and we really do need to strengthen uh, vaccine research and development, not only in low and middle income countries, but uh, for all of us. Okay. I think we should probably wind it up there. Toby, can I hand over to you? For the sure. Page? Thank you very much, gentlemen. Dr. Dr. Kim. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I was supposed to spend 
10 minutes summing up, but I know when to shy away from an impossible task. So uh, I'm not going to attempt to do that. We asked the question at the beginning of um, uh, this event, are we prepared for the next pandemic? And I think we can say we're slightly better prepared, but we're not actually very prepared. Uh, I think would be a, a, a slightly flippant summary of uh, where we are right now. Um, so I know uh, better than to stand between 30 people in a bar, so I will wrap up uh, very shortly. But first of all, a huge thank you uh, to our organisers uh, of the event, to uh, Chelsea, Adrian and Nordjahan. Thank you very much indeed. Stellar job.